Young man, do you want to succeed, to expand beyond your horizons? If you want to be free, then you must learn to master yourself. Your thoughts, feelings, your body and spirit. Master your subjective consciousness. Every action has an opposite and equal reaction. The world outside of yourself is ruled by those who are not ruled by their base instincts. Young man, go forth into the world after this. Meditate, contemplate, then plan and execute an action towards success. Take a risk, break the rules, and be disciplined within self. In the den of iniquity, vicinity no pretty, calamity fi hit me any moment, what's a pity? Tomorrow never certain, what was behind the curtain? The face of evil smirking, with that shifty eyes averting, it's not a steady bubble, that I that pop or topple, many will fall and stumble, let the dozers gather rubble, from a later Colorado, guinea to begin a fossil, cannon could reach the towers, and the troops will storm the castle, he a say, run, run, come, make we get it. Because the peace that is bestowed upon the meek is overrated So run, run, come, make me get it Call in all that data, sound your songs, we come get it I say, run, run, come, make me get it Because the peace that is bestowed upon the meek is overrated Lord, run, run, come, make me get it Call in all your data, sound your songs, we come get it With the rubble steady rising, and hearts are compromising Conditions here are stifling, making evil appetizing The fists are steady forming, and Tenants is falling, defenses are withdrawing, possibilities are falling. In these circumstances, evil will make advances. Pick up your sword and lances, and be sure to take your stances. Victory is never promised. The battle is upon us. Gather the brave and honest, and the righteous in your corners. Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. We are glad to be with you one more time, once again. Highest level conversation on the most relevant topics relevant in this space. Case closed Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. No, that's 4 p.m. Never get the time right. Not good with numbers. I remember telling one of my first engineering managers that, you know, right out of school, <laughs> I was like, I'm not good with numbers. Uh, gladly, he was, I think he was an intuitive Kaizo, so he understood. Everybody else was like, what? What do you mean you're not good with numbers? Age is Age. only a number. Explain ah, ah, Kaizo, you're, 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 you're making LAR suspicious again with, the, with these. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you said you were innocent. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, we have a number of things that we're going to be talking about today, including the retaliation by Iran with the largest volley of missiles and drones ever seen on Earth. It's kind of interesting. Um, these things just kind of happen, like on a Saturday, like, oh, you know, yesterday, the largest volume of missiles and drones <laughs> we ever did before ever was done. And it's just like, okay, all right. <laughs> What's the crypto price? Dude? <laughs> How's <how's> Solana? <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, as you come in, click that like button, click that share button, and let us get in it. But before that, I want to get into something with you, uh, LAR. Um, when the OJ Simpson trial was going on, I, you know, I was back in Nigeria. I was in high school in Nigeria. I don't recall exactly what year it was. 90-something, right? 90-something. <laughs> and it was the first time that I ever saw, like, a full trial. It was, it was a CNN International that I was watching it on, right? 
where, you know, the full thing, the court proceedings and such. I didn't know who OJ was prior to this. Uh, but then seeing the racial aspects and uh, the office of Mark Foreman and the N-word and all that. So interesting, riveting TV at the time. I didn't even know I was coming to the United States. But OJ passed on, 76 years old. I want to play a little clip here. And then I want to ask what you think about this, LAR. And this has to do with the O.J. Simpson trial right after Rodney King, right? And what it did, what it was able to shine a light on in terms of race relations uh, with regards to police, especially, and uh, the black community. So, but, but the one column I wanted to talk about, because I noticed. Of course, I'm going to start. Uh, You gonna blame OJ sense. for this too? Why would it do? Why would it? <laughs> why would it do that? <laughs> and uh, so, but but the one column. I Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I, I used to be disciplined in terms of oh, I should I should just download the videos before you share. Yeah, right. Yeah. Download them. That's why you pay for YouTube uh, Premium, or you just download them other ways and. And here I am, yeah. rookie mistake, rookie mistake. Well, LAR, it's let me, do, while I get this video set, right? And what are you talking about? You're, 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 but you're coming of from all me. the black athletes in America at the time, he was almost one of the last who brought race to mind. You just didn't, mm -hmm. it, it, he was like a crossover hit kind of or something. I don't know how to right. put it, you know? Um, and uh, so, but, but the one column I wanted to talk about, because I noticed, the Charles Blow in the New York Times wrote a thing explaining why a large. <laughs> You're right, nicer. My internet is dusty. Should have restarted the computer before this. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can you guys see the video as well? You can see it, yeah. Okay, so I'll play. You know, my computer was glitching. That's okay. We're hit, kind of, or something. <laughs> I don't know how to right. put it, you know. Um, and uh, so, but one column I wanted to talk about because I noticed the Charles Blow in the New York Times wrote a thing explaining why a largely black jury acquitted him, even though it seemed clear to many of us that he committed the crime. And the funny thing is, I wrote that same column at the time. Uh, and, you know, this is, of course, consistent with one of our uh, our cherished values at the Non-Zero Newsletter, Cognitive Empathy, trying to look at things from other people's point of view. But I remember two of the things I said was, one was, you know, white people just have no idea what the experience of a lot of black people uh, is like in the country. And a good example had been, I think, not that long ago at that point, and I brought it up. Um, it was the Rodney King thing. Does that name ring a bell? Do you remember Rodney mm -hmm. King? So sure. he's the guy. This was at the dawn of the age of like camcorders. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cops weren't used to their behavior being chronicled by people with camcorders. This is long before smartphones. Mm -hmm. And somebody, you know, they had pulled this guy Rodney King over and they say he was out of control. He may have actually been on PCP. I don't know. But they just beat the shit out of him long after they had him subdued. And it mm -hmm. was shocking. And one thing I said in this column was, you know, white people like me are like shocked that the L.A. police behave like this. But pretty much every black person in L.A. has long heard that. OK, so L.A.R., what are your thoughts so far? Now, I know you were probably triggered by the fact that he claims to not. I had no idea. <laughs> um, I guess I, 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 I suspect that that's part of your reaction, but. In general, he, and also he's claiming, oh, his eyes have been opened and he understands why, you know, they would see it, blah, 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 why a jury found him innocent because of the circumstances, blah, blah, blah. What are, you, what are your thoughts, Elia, about what he said? I think white people are just full of it. They know, they know how this country works. They knew how it worked back then. They have, you got to understand how many people had cops in their family. You know, the, the history from from the from the fifties and sixties of police brutality. Come on now. 
a lot of this stuff, even with the OJ trial, like the like you said, the Rodney King, you gotta understand Rodney King, the Rampart scandal, and OJ was basically the same time period. And and all three times white America is shocked. And it's and that's California. The same California that less than 10 years ago decided they was gonna go crazy because Kaepernick took a knee. For what? Police brutality. That's why I say people are full of it. Well put there, LAR. We'll play another more minute, Kaizo, and then I want you to <laughs> see what this guy is saying. He's saying he's practicing cognitive empathy, seeing things from other people's perspective. And uh, he was shocked with the camcorder thing, the recording. He doesn't see this stuff. He is in his liberal bubble writing for the, I think, the nation or the other one, the New Republic, one of those two old school liberal magazines and he was shocked uh yeah that la police behave like this you know and and that's just an example of why uh you might going into this if you were from a background different from mine uh, ethnically and socioeconomically be more suspicious of the police and then there, there was a specific reason for suspicion in the oj simpson case that you don't hear that much about and i later heard an innocent explanation of it but if you're on this it's about the evidence and supposed tampering of the evidence because of the chain of custody in a situation where uh typically happens so basically just to give a quick thing a synopsis of this you take the oj was brought in right and they took blood from him right you should ideally process the blood and do all that kind of stuff right um but it's a long process in terms of storing it and you know the chain of custody type stuff the long process and you do the bureaucracy and what whatnot. So you take your little bag of whatever, you put it in your car and then you drive to the crime scene, right? Kaizo, you're the cop, you're the detect tech detective. And it's something you do all the yep. time. You're always putting stuff in the car and driving up and that blah, blah, blah. But they found out, oh, you took his blood to the crime scene. You plant the blood that we then found there. And so that was, uh, that was something that came to bite the guy, but that was the, fact that Mr. White right here was going to mention. But uh, what are your thoughts about this guy so far? When, and what are you saying about the OJ trial? Yeah, so the, when it comes to these sort of trials, uh, you, you, have, you also have to re realize that the the law is, the, the law has different aspects that you can look into. Is okay, is a person really guilty uh, based on evidence? And is a person guilty based on intuition, gut feeling? And was the rights of the so-called um, accused uh, respected or not, right? Because if this case went on to some kind of Supreme Court or whatever it is, uh, with all the tempering of evidence that occurred, uh, again, taking someone's blood to a crime scene, uh, whether on purpose or, you know, due to incompetence, that is literally um, against the, um, uh, the procedural uh, pr process. So in, in other words, actually, it's more than just a bunch of black people acquitted um oj because well they, they they thought he did it but then because he's black and uh we also know how black men you know let's say uh medical things with the Tus uh, with tuskegee and um the syphilis and all that kind of stuff and in this case of course with uh brutality as well as uh, them making things up it's more than that i think actually from a jurisprudence perspective it makes sense for them to not find him guilty because they would have found him not guilty at a higher court anyways based on the fact that the whole case uh had uh tempering with <laughs> all right all right all right so that was the oj thing here he left us too soon uh at uh, the age of uh, no i think he enjoyed his life you know he, 76, 76. He, can, can i ask something it, yeah go ahead the issue with OJ, in all honesty, was how America spins things and how when it's white people, people just ignore common sense and reality. He didn't just drive the blood to the scene. He sprinkled it around. That's a problem. It's not that the lady got killed. It, and they blamed OJ, it's that the lady got killed and she owed drug, dealer, drug dealers money and she had been notorious for doing that to the point that OJ had to bail her out numerous, 
numerous occasions by paying off the drug dealers. But he stopped doing it. You get what I'm saying? It's the common sense of saying, okay, the the when when somebody gets killed, um, you if a, if a wife gets killed, you automatically blame the husband, and, or or he's the prime suspect number one, which people understand. But they ain't been around each other for like two years. That crime of passion would have happened years prior. You get what I'm saying? And on top of that. The, the issue becomes, so basically you're trying to tell me that you saw a black man in a white neighborhood just walk in the front yard and just start slicing people up and no white person saw it. It's just common sense stuff that, that for us as black people, it's like, this does not make sense. But with white people, oh yeah, you're black. You had to do something because, because you're black. Common sense doesn't matter because you're black. And that's where it goes. How many people prior to that OJ trial and all the way to now have been actually exonerated from, from uh, DNA evidence and people lying on the stand. They've had judges, lawyers, and police chiefs make, make their career off of locking people up. And you find out 10, 20, 30, 40 years later, oh, my bad. But they knew, but you can, but when they go back, they knew the whole time they did that. That's the issue. Kaiser, you were going to say something about O.J. Simpson's death? Yeah, I, guess I was going to say that. Not. Okay, go ahead. No, no, yeah. uh, I didn't know how to uh, work the unmute button. I was gonna say that look, the guy lived up to, up to seventy six or so. That's the same age as my grandfather, right? Uh, before he choked on a nugali, right? <laughs> the point is, um, according to the Bible, he he lived to the ripe age old of uh, seventy plus. So he actually lived a good life. Plus, if you consider the fact that he may have killed a white woman, that's more than a good enough <laughs> life that he lived. <laughs> that's, the, that's the peak. That's a that's peak life right there for for a black man in America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know what like uh you know jokes aside i actually think lar for the first time i actually agree with his whole argument like i i know lar is kind of booty clapping and lying you know that the guy may have not done it but i agree with everything he's saying right if you look at the exon exoneration rates right no let me start from the beginning right uh, let me booty clap for blacks today um, a, a typical white supremacist argument is that um, if you look at the murder rates, uh, black people commit more murder than other groups of people because, well, you can't lie about murder, right? If someone is dead, they're dead. And, and, I, and I used to kind of be one of the proponents for that argument until I thought deeper about it and I uh, looked at the stats and I realized, well, even if someone did die, it doesn't necessarily mean the people being accused were the people that did it, especially when now new evidence keeps coming out. Uh, whereby there's a lot of procedural uh, misconduct that has been observed. Uh, people, unfortunately, in the states that still practice the barbaric act of um, unaliving people have been found to be innocent several times. Uh, black people tend to be, no, no, they, they tend to be, they are the largest group that have, uh, you know, through innocence projects and other projects like that, uh, to be found innocent uh, through DNA evidence that later emerge or um, you know, testimonials that are redacted or uh, other things that happen. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I still do think black people do commit crimes, but I don't think uh, we can look at these situations in, in a black and white sort of um, well, I think there's a lot of brown in there, like a lot of Mexicans stuck in the middle. Let me say this and I'm going to shut up. Seriously. Do you realize back then they basically said he was John Wick because he played in some action movies. That's what they came up with. He's been in a couple of action movies and he knows how to work a knife and he can easily just slice up two people with no issue. He turned into motherfucking yeah. John Wick. And that's a stupid argument. I, I don't understand how that's relevant uh, as a reason for anything. I agree with you there earlier. I think today is one of the situations where I'll be like, nope, uh, I think you're right. So, Dr. Thunder, how's it going? Can you uh, hear us? Can we hear you?
you're getting robbed at the 7-Eleven? Uh, I, I think uh, D is uh, D is sensitive because that could have been her. That was cold. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, Dr. Thunder, yeah, just uh, chime in when you're, because we can't hear you if you are indeed speaking. I'm, I'm in, I'm, I'm here now, so I, I'm just muted because I'm driving. I'll be driving for probably ten minutes, and then I'll find a place to stop. But um, okay, if you want me right. to, if, <laughs> I want right to. Now, you go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, I wanted to get your reaction to this thing on on the OJ stuff, right? But so let me play something for you. I'll play this again, and then. <laughs> You can react to it. Let's see how your microphone sounds or what whatnot. But uh, I'll play this. Sure. And, uh, so, but, but the one column I wanted to talk about, because I noticed that Charles Blow in the New York Times wrote a thing explaining why a largely black jury acquitted him, even though it seemed clear to many of us that he committed the crime. And the funny thing is, I wrote that same column at the time. Uh, and, you know, this is, of course, consistent with one of our... Uh, our cherished values at the non-zero newsletter, cognitive empathy, trying to look at things from other people's point of view. But I remember two of the things I said was, one was, you know, white people just have no idea what the experience of a lot of black people uh, is like in the country. And a good example had been, I think, not that long ago at that point, and I brought it up. Um, it was the Rodney King thing. Does that name ring a bell? Do you remember Rodney mm -hmm. King? So sure. he's the guy, this was at the dawn of the age of like camcorders, okay? Mm -hmm. Cops weren't used to their behavior being chronicled by people with camcorders. This is long before smartphones. Mm -hmm. And somebody, you know, they had pulled this guy Rodney King over and they say he was out of control. He may have actually been on PCP. I don't know. But they just beat the shit out of him long after they had him subdued. And it was mm -hmm. shocking. And one thing I said in this column was, you know, white people like me are like shocked that the L.A. police behave like this. But pretty much every black person in L.A. has long heard that L.A. police behave like this, you know. And so, Dr. Thunder, if you heard that, this guy, for context, his name is Robert Wright. I think he was kind of like uh, assistant editor of uh, the New Republic, kind of classic liberal type guy. Um, you know, that's all for all peace and justice and international rule of law or whatever. <laughs> Um, and he's saying he's surprised, and you heard everything he said, right? You know, he was surprised. Oh, this opened our eyes. And uh, uh, how, how can he claim to have been surprised? Or what do you think about his reaction to the O.J. Simpson case kind of opening his eyes, the camcorder situation with Rodney King and uh, hearing uh, police people use the N-word uh, and such? Uh, what are your thoughts about what uh, he said? Yeah, so, um, so first I want to say I think that this idea that um, uh, uh, all white people are the same with respect to this issue, like of like racial sensitivity or just outright being racist, I think it's just is false. Uh, I think that most white folks are, I'd say a high, I'd say at least ninety, at least ninety percent. Um, are no more or no more uh, racially biased than than black folks. Okay, so that would be the that would be the first thing. Um, now, there are some some uh, some some racist white folks, and there are some uh, benefits of being white uh, when white is the dominant society. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and in and grant that. That being said, um, there is a lot of uh, willful ignorance associated with uh, a lot of these racial issues because there's been enough information pu published, um, enough stuff said by, by black folks and, and other people of color about their experiences, but it just t tends to get categorized in the uh, Y'all just ain't pulling up hard enough on your, on your, you know, your bootstrap, you, you know, your bootstraps, and it gets uh, characterized characterized as lazy talk. Now, I will say that mixed in with legitimate uh, uh, complaints are lazy folks. So that doesn't make it necessarily easier for for people to discern 
the difference between. Uh, that doesn't necessarily make it easier. However, that's the case with everything. That's the case with everything. And so I think that it's disingenuous to try to cite examples where clearly somebody is, you know, they got a screw loose, you know, and, you know, and they're just making stuff up because they, you know, because they were lazy, they didn't graduate from high school, they had their parents, but they just decided to not listen to them, you know, try to find some goofy example like that, and then act as if that is the, that's the standard, and it's just not, so I, so I appreciate if people would just, on all, all sides of this, be more honest about what's actually taking place, okay, now, having said that, um, White folks just have a different experience of, of the world than, than black folks do. Um, uh, and I think that that causes them not to, in general, not to notice certain things. Um, and, it's, and it's not unlike what it is that we, we say when we're talking about, um, you know, women. They just have a different experience of the world. And so when men started talking about, hey, you know, we're dealing with this issue and this other issue and like this, I think that there, there is a level of they actually don't know. But I think that that ends when you see a proliferation of, of certain kinds of messaging and then it's, and, and it's obvious that people have had an opportunity to learn, to learn better. But they don't do it, and the reason that they don't do it is because status quo works out better for them. You know, so that's in, in you know that's not a direct it's not a direct response or answer to uh, this question, but I think it's a good context for these sort of these sorts of discussions because it's not a clear black and white sort of issue. There's a lot of shades, but then there's also a lot of people that are just being being willfully ignorant and acting as if they they don't know when they've been told over and over. So anyhow, that's 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 where I'll go for right now. Well said. Yes, and the question was a reaction to what the guy said. So I think you gave a a, a good reaction. Now, game changer, you stepped in. Did you have something that you wanted to add regarding what we've been listening to? I saw you in the chat earlier, so you've been hearing the conversation thus far. Before we move on to Iran retaliating against Israel. Uh, well, did you have something to add? Um, yes, I, I am eager to get into the Iran and Israel topic, but I'm definitely on what's being said. I, I do think that we as Black people, um, shout out to Dr. Thunder, uh, we do have things that we have to overcome, but we, we seem to have this expectation of white society to know or care about us. Um, it, they do know surprisingly little uh, considering the educational system, the integrated educational system. But when you think about it, we're only 13 percent of the population. I mean, I, I don't care. Like, how much do I know about Indian American history or, you know, Nigerians, um, you know, and their their history in Nigeria? I, we really don't know or care, but we have this expectation that other cultures need to know and care about us when when they don't. I mean, I could see why a white person who has a, you know, almost primarily, primarily exclusive white circle of friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, don't really care about Rodney King. You know, it's something that you sympathize with and then you turn the channel with full houses on. It's, it's not that big a deal to them, nor should it be in the large scheme of things. I mean, you know, we live in an imperfect society and, you know, we work to correct those imperfections. I don't blame them for not having the sympathy for us. I think that we as Black people need to have some, um, a little bit more personal accountability and stop seeking sympathy from others. Well put, well put, well put. Shout out to D and all of the white folks out there listening. Uh, you're justified in not caring. Game Changer has given you carte blanche. Let me just call it right. But, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. I, have, you, have you ever on, had uh, Kuhn in cornbread? Have I had Kuhn cornbread or Kuhn in my cornbread? I don't know. It's 
that that the name of the little boy you got locked up in your basement, Kaizo? <laughs> so Iran launches uh, massive retaliation against Israel with the largest drone and missile strike in world history. And Saturday, Saturday meaning yesterday, uh, you know, about 24 hours ago, something like that. Iran struck with a huge, uh, was huge by uh, by any standard, right? They launched about 170 explosive laden drones, 120 ballistic missiles, uh, 20 cruise missiles, all, all in all about over 300 things. <laughs> Uh, 300 expensive explodey things were thrown at Israel, okay? And I want to play th this little clip here before we start getting right into the general reactions and what perhaps America could have done. You know, America's fault in this as in this is kind of uh, where I want to start this. But let's just play a little bit of this here. Try and drink a little bit more water to get it under control. Okay, so I'm still looking for new breaking news to come out. But what we know at the moment is Iran has launched a total of about 150 cruise missiles at Israel. And there we go again with our uh, with our dusty internet buffering. But And we're not even sure exactly what the total amount of drones are that have been fired at Israel as of this point. But we are told by Israeli officials that 99% of incoming fire from Iran... All right, let me fix this. Well, let me ask the first question regarding this. Now, by the way, just, just for context, like uh, why did Iran attack, right? Um, we well, well, we know, but let's just see what the Iranian media says. The Iranian media said the attack was in retaliation to Israel's strike uh, this month on uh, an Iranian consular building in Damascus, Syria, which killed members of the Islamic Revolutionary Court, right? Now, if we recall, Trump killed Qassam Soleimani, um, but with a strike as well. And Iran retaliated with something that they telegraphed. You're like they they struck an, uh, an American base, but they sent word, kind of like they there was, was kind of like a warning, right? They put a warning out there that they were going to do it. Iran is usually quite restrained, by the way. Generally speaking, when it comes to you kind of look at the Middle East, which Iran doesn't like to include themselves in, but that general area, they're not the craziest people when it comes to actions in terms of what they do, right? They're not the most belligerent. They're not the, you know, they're not Hamas, for example. They do have proxies like Hezbollah and perhaps Hamas and whatnot. But this direct strike is typically not their way. But they went all out here with, you know, retaliating to Israel, right? What is America's uh, complicity in this, if any, right? Uh, should America has restrained Israel more? So I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Kaiser on this one. Should America no. have restrained Israel? I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, great question, right? So just to give background uh, for everyone watching this stream, on the 1st of April, 2024, um, there was a devastating attack uh, in Syria on Iran's uh, syndicates, right? Two generals were killed as well as other um, potent um, Iranian, um, you know, powerhouses, right? Including some uh, Syrians. So, of course, Iran was responding to this uh, situation. And, of course, they they claimed that it was Israel. Israel has neither said it's them and they haven't said it's not them. So by virtue of, um, you know, how that kind of works, Iran decided to kind of re re retaliate. Iran is not Palestine, right? Iran is not some uncouth children just reacting and playing on the victim narrative. So I, I think this is going to escalate. So to answer your question, Ike, more kind of succinctly is, I think America should not, America should say, look, we are um, Israel's, uh, I don't know, ally, especially in the, in the middle dust. However, they shouldn't in closed doors, they need to tell Israel, we're not ready for this kind of war. Um, this thing is escalating beyond um, manners where we can kind of control. So we should kind of take it down slowly. Otherwise, I, I do believe that this will no longer be a desert war uh, based on sand, but this will actually be a proper uh, war based on nuclear 
uh, technology. And I think that's where I'm kind of worried. You have so many fronts. You have the Houthis um, in Yemen. Uh, there's about 200,000 strong army there. Uh, you have the Somali pirates who are going to be uh, recruited by uh, by Iran. I am I'm sure of this, right? Uh, it, it's already being uh, recruited. You, you have Musk, right? One of the Danish ships coming across to the Red Sea from the Suez Canal all across the East African shores into China, India. That's already going to stop. No, that's already stopped, actually. So I, I think this thing is going to escalate to a worldwide um, trade wars, uh, increasing so much taxes and expenses on shipping. America is going to gain more power, though, because I believe with their Navy, uh, I, I believe every single... Um, notable shipping company will have to basically move with uh, an army around them otherwise global trade won't function and we know we can't afford air travel so uh, to answer your question uh, i i think i think america america can't uh, at least in terms of um publicly de denounce israel however what they can do is speak to israel in closed doors and you know try to kind of de-escalate the situation because iran is not a pushover it's not Hamas. So, um, LAR, so let me first of all state that um, I disagree with you, Kaiser, from the perspective of you can say the, w the place, the position that America has put itself in is such that their, they ha their hands seem tied. But you don't have to be that way. There are many ways to booty clap for Israel. There are many ways to be a partner in, uh, in any kind of a relationship, right? So America can draw lines that it actually does follow for example like what it's doing for example in with the russia versus i mean you know ukraine situation where it's kind of like this milli mouth support we're not willing to go all the way but we we don't take deals or we don't take Putin seriously uh keep on pushing the nato thing this stuff happens we're not we know we're not gonna you know we're gonna we're gonna fight russia to the last ukrainian right <laughs> You can just sit here, start a war, push it, whatever, and then you back off. You know, you're not you're not fully in it. I'm saying that America can draw lines and say publicly things like, "Look, here is where we're willing to go, and here is where you know you you must be restrained." And the other side is gonna you know whinge a little bit and all that kind of stuff. But if you start things out that way, then you don't have to be in the situation where you come out and you say, "Well, so I'll before we move on, can I respond to that quickly?" Go ahead. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with your counter narrative. Uh, you are obviously right. Uh, America doesn't have to do anything. Uh, however, obviously, you know, we have Sleepy Joe, right? Uh, over there, I don't think anything new ones can get past uh, that administration. Okay, so LAR, do you think uh, America could have handled this differently? Because let's assume, as Kaiser was pointing out, that nobody really wants war, right? And things getting disrupted unnecessarily. So if that's the, the position of the, you know, Forget the you know the military industrial complex, whom pray for war you know, uh, as you would if you were an executive in that company. By the way, just like you know, some people wake up and hoping for you know cheap internet or wake wake up and hoping for some competition to, to collapse or whatever. If you're in a military industrial complex, you kind of wake up and hope for war. But let's assume that generally speaking, we don't want war. How did America fumble this particular ball? How did they just kind of let this thing get out of hand like this? Oh, what are your thoughts, Ilya? Then, yeah. America is complicit. I mean, one of the reasons why Israel is so out of pocket is because of the 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 idea that if you mess with us, America's gonna help. They didn't gave us money. They gave us weapons. We, we train and all this, that, and third. They'll come over here and blow all your stuff up because you know we us in America, we're like this. You know that that that's what's keeping them afloat and been keeping them afloat for decades. So they've been very disrespectful over the years. The thing with Iran, though, is you say America doesn't want war. Uh, this country, when it comes to the military, is pretty opportunistic. And when you got a when you have a country that has something that we want, we'll make up a reason to go there. And Iran got stuff we want. Plus, the economy is, you know, bad. So them attacking Israel, even though, in my opinion, it's like Israel should have expected that from pretty much the whole Middle East, the way that they go, they're going about what they're doing. Um, 
I could say that America could, could go, okay, well, we're going to, quote, unquote, help Israel, wink and nod, but we're just going to go loot Iran if we can. You know, but that's just my point of view. Mm-hmm. And regarding the belligerence of Israel, Dr. Thunder, um, just read this real quick, that Israel has been... You know, Israel has carried out strikes in Syria against Iran and its allies for years and throughout its six month military campaign against Hamas in Gaza as well. So uh, attacking people in uh, Syria. But the April 1st attack stood out because of its location in a diplomatic compound traditionally exempt from hostilities and because of the seniority. Right. So it's kind of like an escalation and uh, Iran fired back, by the way. There don't seem to be any deaths. The Iron Dome is working well, uh, doing its thing. But those drones are cheaper than the Iron Dome missiles. And maybe Israel has infinite money because of America. Who knows? But uh, Israel is spending a lot just to shoot down uh, these drones and missiles. But same question to you, Dr. Thunder. Did, has the American administration fumbled the ball with regards to letting wars get out of hand in general, like being kind of being provocative, not being pragmatic, uh, almost like opportunistic, just kind of, oh, we'll just see what happens. And if, if something bad happens, oh, we'll take advantage of it, as opposed to actively saying, like, look, no, it's disrespectful to kind of be pushing NATO up in Russia's borders. Uh, look, no, it's kind of disrespectful to all these other kinds of things, right? Um, did the U.S. fumble the ball, Dr. Thunder? Yeah, this is... Uh this is a sort of difficult, um, di okay, so so this is kind of a, without saying it, whose side are you on? Without asking that question, this is, this is asking that question. So at least part of the question is, and again, I don't really have a side, but I will, but I, but I am equal opportunity in criticizing actions that I that I think are um, that are wrong, and so I will say that as far as uh, so there's a there's the the sort of evangelical Christian thing, um, and you know largely on the right on the political right, although there are some iterations of that that are sort of left leaning. Um, which is which is interesting. Left leaning with respect to like uh, uh, feminist propaganda, but right leaning with respect to stuff issues like pro life and stuff like that. So they're so that evangelical sort of um, label is not as monolithic as it as it seems like it is. But one thing that they are um, monolithic on is their sort of uh, dare I say, blind support for Israel. And that's a strong political contingency, every, especially every four years. Um, but then again, like I said, you see that, you see that also. So you see the evangelical Christian thing on the right, as far as believing that there are, they have spiritual reasons, um, religious reasons for backing Israel. Then you have um certain folks on the left uh that are doing this obviously you know biden and uh, that that whole cabinet they obviously have have stood behind one particular side on this issue which is interesting because the democrats are pretty divided on the issue because you have a lot of uh the particularly left-leaning folks that will basically support anything that is not on the israel side so uh, with the whole, you know, Israel and Palestine, they, they, they sided with Palestine, you know, with the, you know, and almost w without overtly siding with Hamas, almost siding with Hamas. I mean, you have folks on the left that are probably cheering Iran on in their bombing of Israel. So you, so you have like a, it's, it's kind of a convoluted sort of mess. Um, but I think that if, there wasn't so much tribalism around these issues, it would be very easy to say, hey, uh, you know, this is why I particularly 
in, in particular, this is why I am a non-interventionist. Uh, I would rather the United States spend its money at home. I mean, we have plenty of homeless people. We have issues that have not been resolved and solved in the black community. Um, um, and you have, you have all kinds of issues here that we should be focusing on more. Now, I'm not 100% non-interventionist, so because there are certain issues, there are certain issues that you may need to address. But I think those that's a very short list, and I think that America is way, way beyond with respect to kind of meddling in other countries' affairs. So, yeah, so that's 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 where I'm going to land at least now. Gotcha, gotcha there. Ladies and gentlemen, go ahead and click that like button as you come in, share the stream, and join us every week, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, case closed, highest level conversation on the most relevant topics in the space. Hamas expressed support for Iran's attack on Israel this weekend, calling it a deserved response to the attack in Syria. Officials from rebel Houthi groups in Yemen congratulated Iran while downplaying their involvement. Apparently, some UAVs and cruise missiles were launched from Yemen. So, Mr. Game Changer, what are your thoughts so far? Did America fumble the ball here? And perhaps you can add also, do you think uh, Bibi Netanyahu can uh, survive this? Do you think that Israel perhaps is on its way down? I heard somebody in another channel talking about, well, this is the this is the death of uh, Israel. It's going down just like apartheid South Africa and such. I doubt that. I doubt that. But uh, what are your thoughts, Game Changer? I doubt it too. I doubt that they're going down because of this. Um, I will say that what's interesting um, all throughout is the way the rank and file America is starting to see Israel um, has drastically changed. So in, in, in a good way, because, you know, what happened that formed the foundation of their country, you know, was a long time ago. And, you know, the overwhelming majority of people there now was not there then. I won't get into details of what form the nation, but so, you know, the, they kind of rode on that for a while, but now the bullied is becoming the bullies, you know, now the gassed is gassing people, which is, you know, sick and ironic. So, um, and people are starting to take notice. I do think that this is definitely affecting their international uh, relations in a negative way to the rank and file. I think that there's a lot of corruption going on in our own government, as well as a lot of UN governments uh, to where they are, they'll be okay in that regard. You know, they are making it in the individual politicians best interest to protect them. So I think that that's the case. But once again, they are attacking, you know, what happened in Syria was was a tragedy. I mean, any nation would respond the way that Iran is um, after what happened in Syria. So um, it's it's a natural response. And yeah, I definitely agree with LAR um, that that they are they're they're spoiled by the protection of the world's um, only existing superpower is what's going on. And now they're becoming a bully. It's kind of like having a big brother who's you know, the king of the block, so to speak. And, you know, Debo is your big brother. And, you know, you just go around picking on everybody. And if they say something, it's like, I'm going to get Debo. If ever that changes, they'll find themselves surrounded by a lot of people that really don't like them. And they should tread lightly because that could change in a, in a moment's notice. Mm-hmm. Kaizo, do you have any predictions here? You... With the yeah. way you answered the first question, you know, had predictions in there regarding, well, what's not going to happen and what not, or what is going to happen or the nuclear. Uh, what are your predictions? And also you can add in there the fact that, you know, we have the Russia-Ukraine thing and uh, Russia obviously kind of, you know, Iran's no one's puppet, generally speaking, but Russia is kind of like, yeah. you know, the big boy over there on the, so, on the Shiite side of the Middle East, yeah. right? While Saudi Arabia and United States kind of control the Sunni side, right? Roughly speaking, but um, yeah. what are your, what are your predictions here? Go ahead. Uh, let me let me start from an obscure place, but don't worry, I'll answer the question. I think that there's some crazy powerful oligarchs that have read the Quran and the Bible and uh, kind of fitting into their prophecies, right? Like Magog and uh, 
you know, places like Turkey, Iran, Israel, all these places seem to be the central uh, conflict and so-called Babylon, you know, America. Um, seems to be the conflict of the world, um, geopolitics, um, um, military strife at the moment. I, I don't think that's by accident. I think certain oligarchs are um, pushing on certain things and uh, within their interest. But anyways, that aside, uh, to answer your question, I think if you look at the whole situation, right now we're having a... This is the first time in the last... Um, this is the Second World War, whereby we're having a cons consolidation of multiple fronts uh, of um, proxy wars happening all around the whole world, right? I'm talking about true world war that p countries entered willingly. A second world war was really European tribal warfare. Nothing really to do with Africa. They were all colonized, and so they were forced uh, to kind of give up soldiers, right? But at the moment, you have um, Russia in the whole of Sahel. The Sahel belt from, all the way from Sudan, which has access to the Red Sea, China, India, all the way into the other side uh, of the Sahel uh, as well through Niger and even Nigeria to an extent with the Boko Haram and those things, that whole belt there, there's Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda moved from the Middle East into Africa. And right now, the Africans, if you look at Niger, Burkina Faso, and of course we have Mali, these three countries were the famous ones to have a coup recently. Sudan's also having a war that's being uh, uh, funded by the uh, UAE, uh, aka America's ally, and Saudis. Right, that that that's the government, and then also have the Janjaweed, which is being sponsored uh, by the Russians, etc. Right, those are the two main uh, conflicts in that region. Then you have, um, of course, in the Sahel, as I mentioned, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mali. All these people fighting for resources, power, control. Al Qaeda I moved over there, Boko Haram in that whole region. These are all the same uh, wars because they're all proxies of either America and its allies, as I mentioned, Saudi is and the uh, UAE, and or it's uh, the allies of Russia, uh, Iran, Turkey, uh, as an example. So my prediction is that uh, America can't stretch itself on too many fronts. Why? Because postmodernism, the loss of war, uh, life, right? America is not under uh, existential threat, meaning it can't just risk its young um, men's lives into uh, what the population would deem irrelevant wars, right? Pro um, wars based on um, resources. So America has to be very careful here. It's stretching itself economically with the uh, Ukraine, uh, supporting Ukraine there, or NATO basically uh, trying to set up a base within um, Eastern Europe. It, it's stretching itself up uh, right now in the Middle East by supporting Israel, um, you know, without any sort of uh, end. So I, what I believe will happen right now immediately is, as I mentioned earlier, the trade is going to be uh, tampered. Musk, right, one of the largest shipping companies, which is da Danish, won't be shipping through the Red Sea, right? That's that's already happened, right? I, I'm already guaranteed that won't happen anymore. Um, any other company that's going to be going there will no longer be using that route because it's dangerous. Houthis, Somali pirates will get... Um, involved in this officially they'll no longer be free agents they're going to be uh given a five million dollar three-year contract in the nba right and of course you're going to have um uh, the other enemies there as well so shipping will be expensive america will have to start using its navy of escorting ships for different companies i do think that will actually help america soft power wise but in general iran is not going anywhere iran's got uh most likely, Iran has nuclear weapons that they're developing. It only takes five years and $1 billion for them at this point. Uh, they already have nuclear power in terms of energy. So I think the world right now is no longer going to be, uh, as Game Changer said, um, uh, only one superpower. You've got China there as well. America is trying to do a crazy trade war. You've got Russia. And uh, I believe that America has to tread carefully. Otherwise, it's going to be involved in an all-out uh, war, which is not good for its uh, uh, people and its politicians. So well, given I, all the... I, Go ahead, Game Changer. Okay, no, I, I do and want we, to respond And we're to in that. the soft guy era. And, and we're in the soft guy era now, too. So what that means, if we go to war, that means women are going, or getting drafted, too. Right? Well, I mean, I wanted to respond um, on the China portion of uh, what he was saying. Yes, China... Um, Having a legitimate threat to, you know, America's, uh, you know, unchallenged military strength or, or, you know, a for believed to be unchallenged military strength, you know, is a huge problem. You know, like we can't just intervene the way that we did in the past with the um, understanding of some who going to check me boo. 
Uh, China is perhaps not, um, as of today, a equal military threat, but you really don't have to be. Vietnam is an example of that. But um, even if you were to go all out um, against a nation like that, or they were to side with someone, um, it's still going to be a huge, huge economic impact in order to fight and win something like that. You know, this is not some, this is not what do you call that, the 100 hour war that we fought in the region before. This is um, something that could be that. So we have to trade carefully. We have to, we have to say like, okay, if we declare here, then someone can declare for them. And then, you know, it could be, it could be devastating to the American, to the fragile American economy. Yeah. What is surprising? Well, perhaps it's not surprising given missile defense is that uh, the damage could have been catastrophic, right? In terms of all the missiles sent and whatnot. But as it turns out, uh, almost all were intercepted. The Iron Dome, right? Iron Dome defense system, each missile costs about $50,000. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one hit, so it's not like they send 300 to take down 300. But I don't know what the rate is. I tried to look for it. Um, well, let's say you you know you have to send you know fifty percent more because they don't hit everything. Even though I don't know what their ninety percent hit rate means, if that simply means that you have to send ten percent more uh, than the stuff that's actually coming at you. But they uh, they got all of them. There was one direct hit somewhere in, in Israel or something like that, but uh, no deaths apparently, given all of this. And Israel has kind of promised a. Uh, 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 retaliation, and we'll, we'll see what happens as uh, as the days go by here. Okay, but um, game changer. Do you think that United States, the enemies of the United States, are getting emboldened? The enemies of the West are getting emboldened by the way we have been carrying ourselves. And it's not about carrying a big stick. It's about meddling too much, but not really standing ten, do ten toes down on on the meddling you're not really you're not really willing to take it all the way you're not really willing to do what you did to japan go in there and restructure their brains and everything or what you did to germany but you're just effing things up and extracting money running all around hiding you know hiding behind your dollars that kind of a thing and now you see iran doing something like this which is not, not typically not the, not the kind of thing that they do same thing with uh hamas earlier and the same thing with the uh with the russians now, we don't want to start talking about China, but it might be the case that China is like, you know what, I'm going to take that Taiwan right about now. It seems, you know, it seems like yeah. a good time. Well, well, go ahead. No, I mean, absolutely. They, they're they not running roughshod as they did in the past. And, um, it, well, you could tell by what's going on in Nigeria and other African nations about, you know, the trade wars and how many of them are siding with China. So, yes, they're, they're not the only big kid on the block anymore. Um, and and uh, countries are starting to take notice. They are starting to see other alternatives and other options, you know, in this form where before it was completely monopolized. And quite frankly, you know, there was a there there was like a unspoken, you know, okay, if we if we don't behave in this particular way, then America will do this because America America has a way of putting its will on people, on nations, that they are certain that won't retaliate. The Somali pirate incident, for example, the Pablo Escobar incident. The, what other nation does that? What other nation sends military forces out to you know attack, even though these are criminals, sovereign citizens of other nations? That's just unheard of. But you know, when you're the big kid on the block, you can do that. I mean, imagine if some Somalia was to do that here with our military, like, or excuse me, uh, with their military. Like, so yeah, there is that. Um, I think that as other nations grow, um, as BRICS grow, we are going to start to see less of that. Absolutely. There is a certain arrogance that I, you know, you, I'll never forget when one of our spy planes landed in China, crash landed in China and George W. Uh, demanded that they send it back intact and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, really? You know, what type of, now, of course, this was this was the early 2000s um, and China 
you know, did develop rapidly in the last uh, 24 years. But uh, what type of arrogance does it take to say, you know, to demand the spy plane that they were using to spy on them back, you know, untouched? Like, it's, it's you don't hear that type of talk anymore. You don't. Uh, interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, so we all know about our boy Sam Bankman Freed. Shout out to the super chat. Two pounds. Wagwan. Say what's a guan in this year country? Word them up, word them up, word them up. Thank you very much. I, I see that on movies and shows. What does that mean? Wagwan? Yeah. What's going like, on? What's going on? Okay. Wagwan. What's going on? Wagwan. Literally okay. the same sound, that kind of thing. Makes sense. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so um Sam McMinfried, yeah, we 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 uh we follow that whole thing very uh, closely throughout the uh, the case in this show that is right you know we were here we gave predictions when he first kind of got you know sniffed out and got uh taken into a, a jail in the bahamas and then brought over here and all those other kinds of things and um i think in the panel we talked about yes that he's gonna go down i don't think anybody necessarily thought 25 years in prison and basically this is federal federal case correct me if i'm wrong lar uh, and uh, you just sound like you know these kinds of things, but it's eighty percent, right? Time the time federal court is very different from you know these other ones. When they come after you, number one, they're gonna they already got you, right? So it's like <laughs> their conviction rate is ridiculous, right? Uh, if they're coming after you, just you know you're not you're not you're, you're going down because they've just decided to take you down. And if they don't come after you, it's because they're just letting you you know live. But also, you have to do eighty percent of your time in federal court. So he's going to at least do 20 years, right? Um, let me see if I can just play a little bit of this uh, other thing about Iran first before we start talking about Sam bankman fried and whether or not we're surprised, whether we think perhaps he may, might be pardoned. The fact that actually a lot of the coins that he held, right, the Solana and all these other things have like 10 x since he got gotten, right? So there's actually a lot of money. And people are getting their money back, but back in old prices, not the new prices. So they're not actually getting the full money. They're getting prices frozen back then uh, and whatnot. But before we go there, let me see here. Let's close out this Iranian strike situation. Oh, we're still still being weird. Okay, cool. Oh, no, so no, I mean, getting I, I right into Mr. No, no, no. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> what were you going to say? No, I, I wanted to, um, before we wrap it up, I, I just want to um, say something on the missile aspect, the financial missile aspect uh, that we were talking about before. So, um, or that you mentioned before with the with the um, Iron Curtain situation or the Iron Dome, I forget what it's called. That is how Russia had a tremendous loss that, you know, um, possibly caused the economic collapse that caused the, you know, fall of communism in that region or fall of the Soviet Union in that region when they, when, you know, the Afghani missiles uh, to anti-aircraft missiles were, you know, significantly less expensive than Russian aircraft. So, you know, they, you know, in this useless war, much like the Vietnam War, they were losing a lot of money, even if you won you know, that particular war, you were losing a lot of money. And yeah, it did have severe economic impact. So you might be on to something when, you know, you say they're spending more on their anti-missiles than the Iranians are spending on their missiles. So, you know, then it's then it's a matter of who goes broke first. Yeah, who goes broke first. Russia might also be giving Iran some of this stuff or uh, guaranteeing Iran that they'll be able to re-up, if you will. And because Russia has every incentive to do that to kind of distract the West and just keep America kind of confused and whatnot. Well, so, they have their, but but you know, do you think so? Given their circumstances, I mean, they are losing. Um, Russia is not actually losing, especially when you compare. Because you know, it's one thing to say Russia is losing, but then compared to what? Ukraine. If Russia is losing, Ukraine is losing more. 
because well, I, mean, I don't think America really has the pullback. Go ahead. If, if your intentions is, is attrition and to do so in a economically sound way, meaning that you know the amount of the amount that you are spending for uh, what you receive from Ukraine, they're losing in that regard. I'm not saying that Ukraine is necessarily winning. You know, just like Afghanistan wasn't necessarily winning or even Vietnam. But I mean, when the purpose of the war was to set out to do something they, and which is not done and the expense in doing so is becoming crippling. 100 percent, 100 percent. And just so the I last kind of. Kaizo. I was going to say, yeah, if he's comparing uh, Russia to America and Vietnam, yeah, I agree with him 100 mm-hmm. percent. Thank you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the thing about war and money, right? Just a quick kind of closing thought on this. You see, back in the day, you know, when you had the barons, the gentry who owned the land, it is your job to protect the land. They get honor for being, you know, the, the knights and the warriors and the whatever. And even up to like Roman emperors, right? Most of them died violently, right? And if you're going to do emperor-ish, you go out there and literal emperor-ish is being out there fighting. So you have to raise money and go out there and also risk your life. The thing about being in charge of the world's currency, which the America literally is, it's only one real currency in the world, and that's the dollar, is... You could just print money. Not only are you in an office, air-conditioned somewhere, deciding to go metal, like killing a few thousand people here and there in war, but you can also do that by literally just printing money. You don't feel the financial pinch, and you don't actually are not out there. You're not a baron or lord, a Caesar or anything, risking your life. And it's just 100% grift. Uh, this is not, not no no judgment, right? <laughs> it, but it just is what it is these days um so we can put a button on that unless somebody else had something to say to uh, on yeah the, uh, I, i'll say this to that um it's it's not infinite um you know of course there's inflation but also there's there's something there's something else that's keeping it i mean you know there's perception and reality and the two obviously don't match um on an international scale the reason why the printing money system works is because there's a uh, there's the illusion of greater value that people have, um, even though you know the dollar may be hyperinflated on an international plane, meaning that um, other nations still believe in the strength of the dollar, um, even if it's not as strong as it should be. So there is a perceived value of what a dollar is worth, and then there's the actual value that the dollar is worth. And sometimes it takes a while for for the two to catch up. I mean, it eventually does. You know, if, if somebody were to print, say, a trillion more dollars, you know, and the price of bread is now $10, $10 it will eventually become clear to, well, first, it'll become clear to the citizens of the US, the one that are spending the dollars the most, that the dollar isn't as strong as it used to be. And then over time, it becomes, you know, clear on an international scale. So it's, it's not as strong or, or excuse me, uh, there is a limit to that ability. Mm-hmm. 100%. So, Sam Bankman Freed, let me play a little clip here. That is, if my dusty internet decides to do it, let me play a clip about the depositors, the people who put their money in FTX. So, you take your fiat, you buy some Solana in FTX and you just do an exchange. That's what you're, you know, you're, you're buying and selling crypto and whatnot. And then gets frozen due to bankruptcy and are you getting your money back? Well, that amongst other things regarding Sam bankman fried and his 25 year sentence, we're going to be talking about, but let me play this real quick. So dropped, we talked about SPF getting 25 years uh, and that broke right as we started the show, and we discussed that the customers of FTX were going to get being made whole. <clears throat> However, there was an important note. FTX deposits are getting paid back in US dollars, not the crypto. That dollar amount, we've learned, is based on the price of their tokens at the bankruptcy date. The bankruptcy date was November 11th in 2022. Super important because the report that started the run on FTX was 
published November 2nd. There's a couple of days in between those two days. Yeah, so a few days before the run on FTX, right? They, a few days before the bankruptcy, right? They, they reported, hey, something's going to go down. I think the uh, CEO of Binance actually sold all his um, uh, FTX coins. I forget what they're called, what they were called now, and caused a run on that. So basically, you had Game Changer, $100 worth of Solana, because you know, Solana was worth $100. You had it in there. They called a run on this thing. Everybody rushed it. Solana dropped down to $10, right? And then they froze it. You're like, okay, stop. So you have $10 is basically what they're saying. They're not saying you have 0.1 Solana. They're not doing it that way. They're saying you have $10. And then since then, Solana has gone up to $500, $1,000. But they're only giving you $10 worth. But let me continue playing this here. It's and a bunch of crypto plummeted. Solana dropped uh, 50% between November 5th and November 11th. That's just one example. But since then, Solana's been up 11x and Bitcoin's up 4x. Ethereum doubled. So you one of these deposits, you miss that run up. And so FTX customers are rightfully furious. I'll pause there before I get into more details. Any, any thoughts on this, sex? Yeah, I mean, just to hit the nail on the head here. If you had left your Solana at FTX, you're going to get $16 per token back. And that apparently was the price at the time that they went under. So according to the, the judicial proceedings, you've been quote unquote made whole. But the truth is that Solana at this moment is trading at $188. So you have not been made whole. And this is why the crypto community is furious. And so that, that basically is the correction. Now, I thought it was interesting that the judge played into this notion. And we talked about that quote from the judge last year. He said, go to Vegas and then pay them off with it then you still committed a crime. He seemed to be concerned. Come on, you mean I can't just take Game Changer's money, gamble, give him back? Um, do you know what the bank is doing with your money, Game Changer? Are they gambling in Vegas? But anyways, so let's start with LAR here, right? SBF, 25 years. What are your thoughts, right? We, we recall, we, we watched the whole thing when it was going down. We made predictions. We talked about it and the crazy gym, gymnastics that he was doing with his Alameda uh, hedge fund and whatever. Uh, basically creating money out of thin air and exchanging it between two companies that he owned and whatnot. But what are your thoughts regarding the 25 years, the 80% that he has to do, the $11 billion that he's been made to pay back in addition to the fact that, you know, the liquidation and all these other things. But what are your thoughts, Elior? It's actually 85% as far as go. the time. Um, I don't know if he's going to make it. $11 billion is a lot of money. And if he ain't paid it back now, <laughs> what are we talking about? Like, I don't know if he's going to make it. Um, He got what he asked for. I mean, he does. Here's the interesting thing. And I'm going to say this, and it might sound messed up, but people like him, um, who was the guy with the Ponzi scheme, Bernie Madoff, they really get off light. They were like, the amount of damage that they actually committed, you know, they, they, they get light sentences for what they've done. Cause, because you gotta you gotta know that they've ruined maybe hundreds, if not thousands, of people. So to me, you know, I don't think he's built for for for, for prison. They're gonna have to put him somewhere nice and cushy, because if they don't, he's a dead man. So as far as like the market or whatever, they tell you that crypto is volatile. So you understand the volatility in 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 this in this sense. You know the United States government ain't finna pay you back. So you know it's it's not like it's FDIC insured. You get what I'm saying? So this is a possibility. Mm -hmm. Just like all the people who lost all of their money when um, Luna crashed. They can't get it back. Luna. But I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, Bernie got hit harder than uh, Sam. I forgot what Bernie got, but some kind of crazy amount. And he was an older man anyway, so he was pretty much a life sentence for, for Bernie made off. Um, and also, Bernie did a straight-up Ponzi scheme. Sam... 
did something a little different. And the crazy thing about what Sam did is that he didn't have to, LAR. Just imagine, right? <laughs> you, you're this kid, you start arbitraging Bitcoin by buying Bitcoin in Japan and selling it in the United States, like instantaneously, right? You're like, oh, I noticed a 10% difference in the price of Bitcoin in Japan and the United States. The market is still new, blah, blah, blah. And you just start running this, this thing, right? Okay, you write a little program, you're a little nerd, and you start making money. And you build this thing called Alameda Research. Because, you know, you can't call it a hedge fund. It's Alameda Research. And it actually, you know, it, it passed the scrutiny easier because it's Alameda Research. And then you start making a... <laughs> Go ahead, Elior. Here's the thing. And, it's, and this ties into everything we talked about from OJ to Israel to this. <laughs> when white people do stuff, people just overlook the massive destruction that they create. It's like, hmm. Yeah, I, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Like, you know what? Let's reverse this. You know what? If Israel was Rwanda and Sam Bankman Free looked like OJ, how far do you think this stuff would have could have gone? Yeah, he, he wouldn't have been able to put it off. Um, but I'm not saying you're saying I said I'm saying this, but the point of my whole diatribe there was to just show that this is the guy was legitimately making money then he created this other company and he saw wow i can now make millions but then he saw a little <laughs> and that's where you stop right um uh, lar you don't go do this other thing where you're like if i just played this trick which is amounts to if i just took the depositors money and put it on red <laughs> i can quadruple it every month right and he didn't have to do that shit he like, did. It, it was just like, dude, you actually had a legit thing going on. He didn't. But and politicians in America don't have to inside a trade to become multimillionaires. But guess what they do? Nancy Pelosi's uh, trading record is if you just follow her trading record, it's it's almost perfect. You, you, yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of crazy how that's not illegal. But um, Dr. Thunder, what are your thoughts about the 25 year sentence? Right. We followed the tr case. We talked about predictions. We predicted certain things, as a matter of fact. And now he's got the 25 years. He's going to do 85% of it. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about one one particular detail uh, associated with this. Um, um, so the, the, the amount of money that has to be paid back, it may not look like this, uh, but this is, this is actually doing two things. The, the one thing is, yeah, you're, 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 you're paying the people back. That's, that's, that's great. And that's, and it's punitive, but also it may actually keep him alive because the people that are owed money, mm -hmm. you know, they, they'll want him to stay alive. So whatever, if, if he just got the time, but was not sentenced to, you know, pay back, have to pay back, you know, this money. And then also, if they didn't think that he would ever be good for it, he's dead. You know, quick, quickly dead. Probably tortured, then dead. Right? If you mean he'll if kill he, himself. Right, right, right. Um, but if if he at least has to pay it back, then it's like that's a little bit of a buffer. Maybe he gets pushed around, but this is also the guy that's going to that's going to give you the money back so you don't actually want to kill that guy doctor so so go ahead i just got a question do you think sbf is the type of guy to pay anybody back uh, i i don't i don't know that he is but what i'm saying is the with the sentencing that's that's actually partly what that actually does so it's it's not just it's not just about people getting their money back if they're going to get it back or not. That's not that's not the that's not the point. I'm I'm saying uh, it's likely that say say if he pays he's able to pay fifty percent of it back. Say if he is able to pay thirty percent of that back. That's still more than zero. And if they're saying that he has to pay it all back that still may serve as a sort of barrier of protection. So I just, I just think that that's, that's an interesting sort of nuance there. Yeah. 
And then the other thing I was going to say is, uh, um, you know, with respect to just being greedy, you know, um, I, it, it just seems to be the nature of, of the thing, you know, it's, uh, you're making a whole lot of money. You see that you can make a whole lot more money. And I, I don't know a lot of people that aren't going to probably take advantage of that. But, you know, especially if they think they can get away and with they it. They are acting like he's all holier than thou and stuff. But, but go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think I think um, there are very few human beings that would be would be able to not take the money. So 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 here's here's one of the here's one of the reasons I say that. In this situation, it seems to me to be highly likely that. The reason that he was willing to take this risk is he's likely done something like this before and got away with it. It may have gotten away with oh, yeah. it a lot oh, yeah. of times, uh, but 100%. just less money. Yeah, but just less money. This time he was like, "Well, hey, I got, I got, I got away with this, and I got five hundred million. Okay, let's. I hey, I think I can get, I can get a couple million, a couple billion out of it, or whatever, you know. So that kind of a scenario um and then the other thing and then the last thing i was going to say is i think it is true that it seems like folks you know we'll, we'll call we'll say dominant society folks seem to get away with stuff that folks from subordinate societies would not get away with that that does seem to be the case and of course they have disproportionate access to the power the reins of power and to and to relationships with folks that are, uh, uh, you know, essential and high up in the power structure. That's just how that that's how that works. Um, now, <laughs> but who really is being hurt? It seems to me that disproportionately, the folks that are that are hurt by somebody like this, or other members of the dominant society, because members of subordinate society disproportionately do not have the kind of um, holdings or the kind of, you know, they don't have uh, capital wrapped up in as, as much in the sort of things that were being exploited for him to get this, you know, payday. So they're getting away with it, but in on all honesty, is it black folks that are, 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 are holding the bag or is it disproportionately other white folks that are, that are holding the bag, left holding the bag. So I, I, I just I thought that was interesting too. That's not to take away any any steam out of LAR's point because I think that it is a valid point. But when you when I'm digging deeper, and I start thinking, well, who's actually being hurt most? It probably is actually hurting them more than it's hurting us, per se. Indeed, yeah, good points. The fine being a means of actually, or one of the possible outcomes, one of the advantages, one of just the facts that follow from having a fine is that, and then people are incentivized not to kill you. And also this thing about the dominant society versus the others, if you will. It's kind of interesting, LAR, that you talked about Rwanda, because um, if you do it outside of the US, like the Nigerians, you know, they're able to do stupid stuff like sell airports that don't exist and, uh, take public companies public in the Australian stock market for billions of dollars. And <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, I mean, some, some black people are doing it to come, uh, come on, man. LR, you know, we gotta, we're making some progress. <laughs> Didn't they catch that dude? Yeah. 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 That's how he was talking about it. They caught him. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> That's not progress. <laughs> <laughs> so, gotta get away with it. Okay. Nice you know, th these people tend to always have some, like, uh, you, you know, I, uh, I, I'm I, convinced that these villains, right, again, um, actually choose a, a name that's befitting of the crime as well as, uh, the, you know, Hush Puppy, okay. That nigga was never Hush. He was all over the <laughs> Instagram, everybody just, you know, wearing the most expensive things, going all over expensive um, jets and everything, right? Sam Bankman Freed. He is no longer free, right? <laughs> Bank man. Yeah. All that, all these, I swear these are like villains from Marvel or something, man. I mean, 
Bernie Madoff, right? You know, making off with your money and all that stuff like that. J just for the record, folks, do you? <laughs> this is the same guy. Wasn't he paying off politicians and celebrities? Oh yeah, big time, big time. He was. And the thing is, what's kind of crazy is, this was part of what he was using the money for, right? So as Dr. Thunder pointed out before, the way he went at, immediately after he created this FTX, he started doing this thing between the comp uh, FTX and the Alameda Research. He saw that basically. He could, it's essentially if you borrow money to buy a car and then use the car's collateral to borrow money and then you use that, go to like 20, back, keep on using the same item as collateral to get more and more money. So he's basically between his two companies feeling that there's money over here and but it's not really money over there because uh, FTX treats Alameda especially, doesn't really actually make it pay the money, it owes blah, blah, blah. So he started doing this thing, like probably... You know, Dr. Thunder, you can kind of imagine he probably just did it one night and he got like a thousand dollars. Maybe the first time he did it, like, oh, so I could just do this to FTX and then Alameda. And then the next day I did it, blah, blah, blah. And then what he started using that money for was he thought, so he, he was playing this game. He's like, <clears throat> if I run fast enough, if I, if I curve this ball and if I get political influence and I use the same trick to make a whole bunch of money and pay Barbara Boxer and all these other people and show up in the Congress and have them write crypto policies that's favorable to me. I'll come out of the richest man ever alive and also I'll have made it out. What a great game for like a gambling little guy who was also on speed, by the way. Like he was, you know, he had these patches of, I don't like to use the word speed, but all these amphetamines that all these people are on, right? So he's so, out there tweaking out, being able to just make money out of thin air. But anyways, go ahead. <laughs> so basically you're telling me some high dude messed around and took an equity loan on his own company, like a house, twice. And nobody was the wiser because he was white. Um, uh, well, you, 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 you can put and it that way. The white stuff as well. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just, oh, well, let's be specific. The kind of white he was, oh yeah, just like the kind of white Madoff was. Oh yeah, they, they got it. Oh, now we, okay, we're, I, I really we're gotten down to the specifics now. <laughs> so, uh, game changer, right? You understand? This is right up your alley. You, 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 you fiddle around with zeros and ones and try to figure things out. And um, so this is one of your dudes, and he he went a little too far with it, and he got twenty five years. Um, is he super bad or is he just indicative of the what we call the degen generation, right? Degenerate gamblers. People out here because, look, I'm not saying that Sam Bankman Freed was doing this because, you know, life was hard for him. I'm just saying that in the, amongst millennials, right, there is a tendency to gamble because things are actually harder for them in terms of assets. The interest, you know, assets rates be ballooning up while their salaries are not going up, hence increasing their uh, debt and hence also with the spike in interest rates recently just makes it really really hard so let's FOMO into crypto let's find the latest crazy meme coin and 1000 exit and then oh people also making their own meme coins and chilling and, and rug pulling on people so it's just like a, a billion you know Sam Bachman frees all the way from Malaysia to India to United States or whatever and uh, what's the big deal game changer no, I mean, I do understand that this generation. OK, so never in a place of time has there been greater reward for risk takers uh, than right now in the U.S. You know, um, a young person can drop out of college and start playing video games or a young person can drop out of drop out of Harvard and, you know, start Microsoft and Facebook. You know, like never has there been a greater incentive to go against the grain, so to speak than it is now, nor is it, and also there's a, young people are disincentivized for going with the grain because companies are not stable because they're ran by people like this, but companies are not as stable as they used to be. Chances are the places that you work at a high school or college, uh, you will not work at for the next 30 years and then retire unless you're in the military. So um, there is an incentive for people to be risk takers. And I do think that in that spirit, you do have people that cross the line. Now, as far as as um, sentencing goes and things like that, um, the 25 years or 85 percent of the 25 years, I, I think that because uh, a friend of mine who got 19 years for something far less 
But I think that with crimes like this, crimes that are difficult to spot, prosecute, that the that a regular day to day police officer isn't going to catch you, you know, doing. So I think things that are very difficult to prosecute like this have stiff sentences because they're they, they want to they they want to when people do a risk benefit analysis, we're talking about a huge benefit here. And they want to make sure that what they're risking will counteract that to discourage the behavior. And that's all it is. You know, a lot of people who are unknown are doing similar things. So they want to deter them because they cannot find them as easily. 100%. There's a general like, kind of Silicon Valley ethos of move fast and break things, right? You know, in other contexts, we talk about companies like Uber, Airbnb coming in and to hell with the, the law. I'm going to make it such that the, the people are going to be using my stuff before you realize that I'm breaking the law. And then by that time, it's too late, right? I become the new law of the land. This is the general kind of tendency of uh, the entrepreneurial mind, right? You're always <laughs> trying to, you, you, you throw, you're juggling, right? And you throw a ball into the future or a piece of glass. And you're like, okay, I think I'm going to be able to get this rocket booster and move fast enough into the future and catch that glass, whatever it may be, right? I, 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 I've I done stuff like this, similar to stuff like this, like, okay, cool. Uh, I'm not going to incorporate this year, 2019, but then I'm going to do this and this. And by the time I get here and then the IRS, uh, and some of it didn't work out, right? But, <laughs> but yeah, the idea is <laughs> you kind of grow into the mistakes and then you, you, pay, you pay the technical debt. It's not actually technical debt in this case, right? But you pay the, it, it's similar, very similar to technical debt, right? In, in programming, right? You're like, okay, I'll, I'll come back and fix this later. But yes, um, Miss, well, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, without consequence, it is. So like, I mean, it, you if you just fix it later, then it's like, it's never was a problem. Um, I wanted to I wanted to speak right quick on something that LAR was saying um, earlier about white people crime. Yeah, um, white guys do tend to be more brazen and that's because they suffer fewer consequences. Uh, black men are the brunt of consequences, which means that we um, should be and are um, outside of the pookies, um, you know, a lot more risk adverse. So, um, and you think black people should be less risk adverse? Maybe they should be more embracing of risk. It's it's something I'm legitimately advocating for. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I think that black um, people, black men in particular, should take more risk um, when it comes to financial endeavors. Um, I think that the reason why I brought up Pookie is because I think that the risk we take, um, I don't think that they are really doing like a proper risk benefit analysis, you know. Because if you look at the years versus the crime, like, you know, wow, you could get 25 years for selling something that costs $10. You probably wouldn't take that risk. But on a higher end, like, you know, you can make $25 and, you know, and there's a small possibility that you get five years. I, I do think that we should do the math and, you know, make proper assessments. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, in, um, when I was younger, the... The I don't know if I was out of college or in college, but um, I was approached actually by a um, white dude, uh, equally young white dude, who and he he could be rich um, by now for all I know. Um, he said, "Look, I know all of these VCs, you know, who is going to invest in a music app, and you know, you don't actually have to make it for me. You just have to make it look like this is a viable product." I was like, "Are you kidding me? You just want me to create a front end shell so you can." go to these people and they're give you money thinking that it's going to be a real thing and you're just going to take the money and spend it like you actually do stuff like i, I was actually shocked that vaporware was, that's how it's done that's what no i said uh vaporware that's what they call it right and that's how it is done right you know you i didn't even know it's so black people you know had he not approached me for for being in software wouldn't even know that stuff like this exists like really people are actually foolish enough to give you money not and you don't actually have to deliver what you're saying that you deliver. It's and and they're okay with this. I, I I was really shocked. You know, I didn't know this guy very well, but I was really shocked that that was that that was a thing. So I do know that they do it a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot. Um, they have the connections, and you know, quite frankly, they have the pedigree for it. One hundred percent. And uh, it, it happens all through Silicon Valley, and anyone whom kind of takes this Silicon Valley entrepreneurial type of ethos, such as Elon Musk taking his com company public. And he's definitely 
uh, accused of vaporware a lot regarding saying the things that his company, Tesla especially, is going to do or what they're going to have or whatever, right? But uh, by next quarter, we'll have this. And it's like, okay. Uh, he knows and none of those people went to jail, right? Elon Musk is not, a, he's the richest man in the world and not no, in no, jail. No, he's, not, he's, not, he's, not, right, he's right. Not definitely not going to jail. Okay. Right? So, so, but you so got you, it like that. Go, 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 go on ahead and be black and try vaporware. You're going to have, you're going to get 35 years. You know something? I, 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 I will. I mean, well, I'm not saying I will. I'm not, I'm not going to do something like that, but, um, but I'm saying, I, I think that perhaps we should, that we should listen. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, 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 I just think we you. should. Yeah. I feel you. I definitely feel you. And that's why I asked the question because, you know, the, the rules, generally speaking, and, you know, we have morality, you have ethics, and then you have the law and these rules, right? The law and the rules, uh, look, man, if you keep on respecting them too much, it'll just continue to keep the same incumbents in power that it is meant to protect. Got to keep on trying to find holes in those places. Like right? the bankruptcy it, laws? Uh, well, yeah, all, the, all you know, whatever kind of loophole or whatever thing you can kind of do to right. those are not, you know, it's not written by God. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. It was just I, I, when black people started doing it, it became illegal. No, it's <laughs> yeah. always it's always been illegal. Lar, it's always been illegal. It's it's just that you it's it's just that certain things that we do when we do things that's uniquely or culturally identified as a us thing, then it becomes heavily prosecuted like selling drugs or the particular drugs that black people were known to sell for. I agree. But, you know, I don't I, I can't see them prosecuting heavily, you know, or investigating because we're not reputed for doing such things. You know, if and Game and Changer again, created a shield what I described on the Solana network tomorrow. Right. And rug pulled on people. First of all, people will not even know if it was a black person that created this shield meme coin and rug pulled and made seven seven hundred million. It's not then, you know, but anyways. Uh, You'll you be guys. the O.J. Simpson of Vaporware overnight. Hey, I, 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 today, um, can you guys, hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah we got you. Okay, yeah, I, I, um, I did a, a, and this is ancient history at this, well, not ancient history, this is, this is about a year ago, uh, maybe a little bit longer than a year ago, on one of my morning shows, and the name of the video was, This is Why Cussing and Breaking the Law is Not a Sin. Um, and the point, the point of the video was to show that, uh, so first of all, there is no explicit list of quote unquote cuss words in the Bible. And even if there were, they would be in a different language, right? So, so there's, there's that. And then, uh, perhaps one, one way of thinking and there is a principle that talks about how uh, we should we should follow the laws of the land, but understand that the laws of the land in that context were believed to emanate from the very throne of God, as opposed to as opposed to a system where you vote for the people that you want, and then you put those in in those people in power so that they can change the laws to whatever your your desire is. So. Under that system, um, and even speeding, for you know, for instance, that's not a sin per se, right? Because o otherwise, you'd you'd have to say, well, the speed limit on the highway used to be sixty-five. Now it's seventy. So was it a sin when I was driving seventy when it was sixty-five? You know. So, so, so we're talking about different, different sort of classifications of, of, of ideas. Absolutely. Um, and so I, I think it's important for people to understand that a lot of people put themselves in a prison. And so then they're following all the rules and doing all the right things. But as we're, as we're discussing, it doesn't really put you in a scenario where you can exploit the loopholes in the, you can exploit certain issues. Um, uh, one of the one of the things that gets talked about a lot in this space is, you know, people will say, well, you know, I'll do a I'll do a spiritual marriage or like a sacramental marriage, but I'm not doing the legal, the legal thing. OK, and that's interesting because the legal thing has only really been a thing not for very long. Right. 
So it used to be that churches and religious religious institutions, they were in charge of keeping records of who was married. So being married in the church was all that was necessary. It wasn't until the, the state found that they could, you know, get some money for a license, you know, then they could do some things, you know, to extract more taxes or less taxes or incentivize people based on them being married and all this kind of stuff. And but you have a lot of Christians uh, running around talking about how, you know, if the state is not involved, that it's not a real marriage. Now, that's a, see, I mean, it's, it's a contradiction in terms. We're not, we're not talking about the same things here because the state horned in on on the money associated with marriage. That doesn't make it any uh, any more righteous to go down to the state and get and, and get a license. You mm-hmm. know, so I, I just think that's a that's an interesting thing. The, the other thing I wanted to say was uh, this this talk about SBF. And just, you know, greed associated with, okay, I tried this. Let me double down. Let me triple down. It reminds me in a way uh, of a recent, of, of an episode that I saw of the Jetsons. I saw this episode recently. Of course, it's from a long time ago. Um, I rewatched it, I should say. Uh, and it's the episode where George, he meets this guy that gives him this machine that can, that can fix his mistakes. So he can go back in time and he can fix, you know, he can fix these mistakes. And so he does this to the point of becoming president, like the universe, and being filthy rich and worth a lot of money. But he discovers on this last time, because he had turned time back a bunch of times, he did something that actually made it so that he didn't end up getting uh, married. And then, of course, then his kids didn't exist. And so then now he's just here with a big pile of money, but he doesn't have the, the people around him, which sort of made that seem to make to be valuable to him, right? Because it's not just about having a big pile of money. It's about the people that have been around and kind of seeing your transition and you being able to do things and help folks that are around you. See, that, that's, that's part of what makes that sort of meaningful. But, but part of me also thinks, though, you know, I think a lot of people would watch that episode now, and they would say, "Why would you, well, why would you why George why would you do what you did in the end to get his family back, but to give up all of the power, all of the glory, you know, all of the money?" I think a lot of people now, because of their general dissatisfaction with the way that their life has gone, and with the people that they end up associating with most often now, um, uh, this could, this could be spouses, this could be all kinds of, you know, could be all kinds of things that they probably be yelling at the, at the, at the screen, George, what's wrong with you? Keep the money, <laughs> keep the power. You can, Hey, you can always get another family. You can always get some other friends. <laughs> I'm hey, sorry you know. to be dark, but I no, just, uh, I, I, I see what you're saying with that, but I mean, black people um, do have a. Um, if you categorize black people between, you know, the the street ones, let's just call them the N words uh, with the A at the end of it, and you know, the the regular black people, regular black people, um, if they if they did have like a reasonable, you know, sense of um, you know risk adversity, you know, sometimes you gotta you gotta take a risk in order to do something. Like Uber, you know, I seen the I seen a preview for a movie where where it was a bunch of white guys and they were saying, you know, that this is illegal, and they just was laughing and then just went on and did it anyway. And here we are using Uber. Like, I mean, you know, like if if we had that, the 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 black the young black men who have that in them tend to get recruited into taking stupid risk at a very young age, um, and you know, they don't actually grow into the stage in life to where they can create Uber or something like that. Yeah, you know, which is sad and unfortunate. But um, I do think that we should take a much, much better um, view of risk reward. And LAR, I mean, you, I don't, I don't know what you do, but in what I do, I seen things. They, 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 they never play by the rules ever. When you're talking about, you know, the greater society. Like I've, I've worked at companies. These companies create magazines 
whose sole purpose is to talk good about the company. So when they say, you know, like, hey, according to this magazine, we're the best company. They own that magazine, too. That magazine was created for that sole purpose. And the person who writes for that magazine is sitting right next to 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 the developer. It's weird. Like they told me something. This freaked me out. L.A.R. They said that um, that that companies create nonprofits to avoid tax consequences and stuff. And huge companies are doing this. L.A.R. The NFL is a nonprofit. I repeat, the NFL, the National Football League, is a nonprofit organization, the same as like a church or something. They are, they are LA, they are so deep into they know all the loopholes, they know all the tricks, and they've been doing it and getting away with it for forever. And I don't think that if Leroy did it, that they that that would really change it that much. I do. <laughs> I do. I, I'm not, I don't have an issue with risk and taking chances. I'm just going to look at society how society has always been. When, when, when you get to the point of legality, yeah, if you're white, you could, you, could, you could break the law or bend the law or not even care about the law. And somehow it's not that big of a deal most of the times. But if you're black, it don't work like that. Uh, it's not race. It's, it's first very of all, much so race. No, it's, it's, it's stupidity. Black people... Okay. Watch black this. people, black people have um, a tendency to be particularly stupid when it comes to um, taking risk. Um, no. And it's, 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 yes, yes. See, okay. What about the movie The Banker that was based on a true story? Okay, I didn't see that movie, but 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 go ahead. That's when a, that's when a black men decided to own to, to 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 own banks because they had to move out west to do it. They wound mm -hmm. up in jail because they didn't want black people owning banks. Okay, um, I don't know the particulars of that movie. So yeah, maybe there is a thing um, with that. But um, what I'm talking about is um, on street level, and which is what the overwhelming majority of um, black men who are in prison, you know, for crimes um, are in there for. You know, we are the people who like to make songs about our criminal escapades and post them on our Facebook and Instagram channels because that's pretty much the type of stupid crap that we do. Like when they do these things, they do it silently. And we're talking, we're not just talking about, we're not just talking black here. We're talking every culture of people. Go to a 7-Eleven. If you go to your closest 7-Eleven AR right now, you will see somebody who is here illegally, working illegally. And they are serving police officers because they're not so stupid as to spin rims and make songs about that. So the person, the owner of that is getting money, you know, for when the you, cheap labor and the the immigrant is getting money that they send back to, you know, their native country. So and, and this goes on in all the liquor stores. This goes on everywhere right around us. But nobody messes with them, you know, because they're not boisterous about it. It's, it's not, not a matter that they're of not race. boisterous. It's it is well they're not white LAR. These are not white people. Just like when you like first of all I wasn't bringing up criminal activity. I was bringing up people who do actual bu businesses that do criminal stuff in their businesses they can activity. get away. Now, when it comes to that type of stuff, 9 times out of 10 Somebody white is benefiting from it. Same thing with Asians and brothels. White people go there. So, of course, they're not shutting them down. The same thing you're talking about with the illegal immigrants. No, nine times out of ten is some business corporation that has one of those things where it's a, a people of color where they get money on the back end type of thing. They're benefiting off of that. L.A.R., that's, that's, that's great, though, because one of the things I was going to mention is that capital or, shall I say, you know, this white big whitey corporate whatever that's benefiting loves risky bold ballsy people right that will go out there and make some shit happen because that's they, they, they need their capital to to move right so if you're in an organization and you're bringing in the money <laughs> okay as i've seen you know being in sales for a while now and just generally speaking, okay, so not just sales, but generally speaking, when it comes to people who actually, uh, you know, break away, you know, the, he, this guy has his own company, he's doing great, he's got all these particular things kind of sewn up. There's always a point where they have to, there's a glass ceiling, and in order to break that glass ceiling, you have to do something typically called conflict of interest or some other type of stuff. In, in uh, they even have a saying for it, in 
Silicon Valley. They say no conflict, no interest. That means if there's not a conflict of interest, then it's probably not going to make you, it. There is nothing going to happen there until you break the yep. conflict of interest, until you do something risky, crazy, whatever. And if you're feeding the right people, the right capital, right, then great. You're the, Because all other people are sheep, right? That kind of a thing, right? So yeah. I'm just saying, hey, who's what's wrong with you know serving <laughs> capital that way? Yeah, this is this is actually I, I don't see anything wrong. Barry this, Gordy, this, this is, is, saying is, I'm sorry, Doctor Thun. I'm sorry. Barry, Barry Gordy was accused of payola, like I mean, and he probably yeah. did it. I mean, considering his success, but so what? It was I love his movies. I love his songs. Like you know, hey, and he's rich. He died a very hold wealthy. on, hold, hold that thought. This, this is where we 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 use something that is semantics but at the same time we we leave out the context a lot of black artists like james brown had to do payola you know why because you had to pay people to play your records because you was black exactly so that's exactly. that you know no so uh they knew that they were going up against people who were getting paid off of them because they wouldn't do their job this exactly. is not that's not that's not the same thing as with Sam Bankman or, or taking a risk. That's not it. You walk that in the is, door. That actually you is knew, it. You knew walking in the nope. door that, oh, I'm not going to get what I want in this situation, so I got to pay this person. Well, I, I see that as exactly the same thing. It's not I, I the really same. Do. Because guess what? It's you, 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 You're you doing something illegal because the payoff is is worth the risk. No. at uh, Was it illegal am back I right? then? No, it Payola became illegal, illegal. after yes, the that's, fact. That's, that's why they brought it up. It became James. illegal after the fact because black artists started making too much money. Okay, well, put it like this. They're from two different eras. So if it was illegal after Barry Gordy, then it was illegal for James Brown. But the point is, is that... No, it wasn't illegal for James Brown. Okay. I, I, I'll, I'll look it up, but I do feel that they um, did something that they knowingly was illegal in order to get ahead. And if not, then, you know, then more smarter than them, more smart for them. But that, look, they took, look, even, they okay. took risk hold, hold and they thought. received reward. I don't even see in the anything music, wrong with let, that. Let me, let me fast forward it. In the 90s and the 2000s, yes. if you worked in the music industry and people, and they used that story before, they would have one guy that works for the label to go to the radio stations with your records. And because, you know, he went to this company, they say, play these records. They charged the black artist $2 million a pop for him doing it. And it was the same guy bringing the same records on the same day. Mm -hmm. They got caught doing that. That was, so that was the 2000s. That that's that was part of the excessive contracts of record labels. That, what we're talking about is on two opposite ends of the spectrum on these things. Yeah, I also I also okay. see another nuance in there. I see um, if you are so even even if something is illegal, but you're doing it because you have to do it because there's a particular bias that someone else doesn't face. I'd still say, technically, I guess you could still say it's wrong. You're still breaking the law, but you're not exactly breaking the law for the same reason. Someone else might be breaking the law, and you know they're breaking the law because who is it, who it is that they're trying to promote maybe just isn't really talented enough. They don't have it like that to be able to do it alone, whereas maybe a black artist is doing it because their stuff will never be played if they don't do it. So that's another, that, that could be another, another layer in, in sort of nuance in there. But either way, you have to be willing to, uh, to take certain kinds of risks if you're going to, uh, if you're going to succeed. And, and one thing I, I think it's interesting, you know, uh, Ike was just talking about, uh, this, you know, the conflict of interest thing, and that's something that I hear all the time in academia. But then you look, you look around, and you see a bunch of folks that are clearly conflict of interest, and that's how they got their their bag, um, and they get celebrated for it. And folks that play politics and do all kinds of stuff that is uncouth at uh, at best, and perhaps uh, even uh, unethical, you know, and you know, in the worst, or even illegal. And they're, you know, they, they get over. 
Um, and then, you know, this idea of using leverage, right? So uh, th it's a, there's actually a rule in place uh, in academia uh, that you are not supposed to leverage job offers, other job offers against a, a current offer. That's actually like a, like a rule. I mean, the way that it's framed is not, it, uh, it doesn't sound like it, what it is that I just said. So it's framed in a way to be more nuanced than that in more gray area so that people that do that, that they like, they can just say, okay, well, we'll match the offer, we'll, we'll beat the offer. Po folks that they don't like, they can look at you and say, well, that's unethical. Right. Because were you really applying for this job because you wanted the job or not? Or were you just using it to create leverage against your current position? Right. So it's always a bunch of, you know, greasy stuff. You know, it, it's 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 never and it's never the people that are the bean counter rule followers uh, that that benefit. It is the rules are designed to keep the people in power and to protect them from basically scrutiny, you know, uh, and always to give them anytime they want a scapegoat. Anytime they want a goat, a goat they, can, they can find a goat anytime they want because the rules are written in, in such a uh, nebulous, gray kind of way. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it, it just gets, it's really, it, it's really goofy. Now, having said that, what I like to see black folks take more risks and be more on the edge of things, I would, but the reason that we don't, and we have to say this, and we and it has been mentioned even in this conversation, Game Changer admitted this, black folks, the consequences are, are worse for us than for others. So us taking risks is not the same as the member of the dominant society taking the risk. So even if so so you're saying I would like black folks to be willing to take more of a risk, that's cool, but it's never really going to happen until until taking risks isn't isn't policed uh stricter for black folks than it is for members of the dominant society. So I mean um, you have sort of a conundrum there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um Let's hear from Kaizo on this. You see, the thing that you mentioned there, um, because it cuts in a, there's a socioeconomic slice from which you can look at that, right? That generally speaking, if you're like Barack Obama, taking your risk and doing blow and being with Becky and going crazy in a kind of a community like Harvard or something like that, safely somewhere in Hawaii, the chance of you getting caught up is less. But when you live in a certain part of town where once you get out of that driveway and you're out there, okay, everyone is looking at your tags and you're this and your dad and did you use your blinker, blah, blah, blah. And one wrong thing, boom, they got you. And then, oh, they found a roach, right? A, a, a little itty bitty weed. Little, how did uh, you would Houston say it again? But anyways, yes, that definitely is the case. 100%. 100%. And one last thing, and then I'll pass over to Kaizo. There are certain contexts where it is easier to get away with things from a pragmatic standpoint. And those contexts are just that, they're pragmatic, right? In other words, I use sales as an example, but there are also certain fields, all right, of work where you, th this is the person that gets the job done and the nature of the job is very clear, right? That, and if you execute this job, in other words, it's not political. The other extreme is the political places, places where, it's not so clear that you can get away with certain things if you're just competent and you produce. Because what is production and what is competence when everything is all based on politics? But if you're in a place where it's all about, you know, I mean, the energy production space and it's all about selling what barrels of oil or whatever, the person moving the most barrels, okay? Okay, nobody gives a crap about what else is happening. And I don't care if you're blue, right? Keep moving those barrels and keep greasing the palm of, of Whitey or whatever. And hey, get yours, get your back. Anyway. But uh, Mr. Kaizo, what are your, what are your, what are your thoughts on all this? A lot has been said. 
I mean, um, the main society, or rather the main ethnic group, race, religion, whatever it is uh, at the time, right, the zeitgeist is considered the main groups um, of society, they will always get more of some of these nuances than you would. And it makes sense, right? Like, let's just really try to picture this, right? There's a little black girl and a little white girl, right? And and you're a a good red-blooded American family. And there's an AI there, right? Who do you think the AI uh, should sacrifice, right? It's obvious. And I don't think it's even wrong, right? It it is what it is uh, at the end of the day. So I think some of these things, you know, you, you have a... Two little he, he just he one. just he just sacrificed little Keisha. That's, that's but I mean, why 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 does the AI in the scenario why does the AI have to sacrifice somebody? Because the, the AI was written by the dominant society and or at least funded by the dominant society. So and it feeds off the information of dominant society. I so yeah, so they, they just some things which are so heavily ingrained within the culture that you will literally see some racism going on. Um, uh, minor sort of infractions going on there and you just think to yourself okay this is wrong and it is wrong uh, i'm not gonna go and make excuses but i, I think us as those who do kind of you know sit on the other side of this whole uh, and again this is not nothing to do with special white people right if you come to africa it's the same if you're from the wrong tribe um you are gonna basically get the, the you know the butt end of the stick for until things kind of change. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is in relation to the whole O.J. Simpson's case uh, and everything that we've talked about here and how unfair treatments, et cetera, um, only time uh, will really kind of make a difference in that aspect uh, over there. And uh, when we're looking at sort of crimes like Sam Bankman Friedman, or rather Freed, these sort of cases tend to be also cultural cases. Cases where they want to make an example, and as I, as I mentioned, he defrauded the community that was the main main community, right? When you look at black people defrauding other black people, nobody really tends to care. Uh, for example, what's his name? R. Kelly, right? Whether you like him or not, that guy did a lot of terrible stuff in the past. Nobody really cared because he kept paying it off. Then they caught him on some Rico case, which he didn't, he wasn't even guilty on, right? Because he now got in the whatever powerful people i'm not going to mention too much on that right he did a little crime didn't get no time then he did not do that much crime but he got the time so it's all to do with the people that you piss off well i I mean r kelly so we're talking about different type of criminals what i'm talking about is um i'm talking about financial reward low risk financial reward crimes that's what i'm talking about because that's what's at play here that's why I brought up things like um, payola and stuff like that. We're talking about we're talking about crimes that have a huge pop- probability of of making money, low risk of getting caught, and um, and low sentencing win cost. I, I think that these are factors that a person should consider before anything. I mean, yeah, and don't get me wrong. Like, there's there's I do understand the existence of. Um, of people, some groups of people being prosecuted, you know, more heavily than others. But still, I mean, you know, to fear the enterprise and the opportunity that comes along with it, you know, um, because of that, I I think that we should probably take a more rational approach to it. And I'm not telling I'm not telling black people to 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 um, become criminals. What I am saying is that our ethics, or excuse me, our ethics um, is making us stagnant economically speaking. And a lot of ways, you know, we we fear cutting corners too much. You know, I had to say on a show um, a couple of months back, you know, the benefits. In fact, I told a young man this this weekend who who recently graduated um, this year. Um, hey, lie on your resume. You don't have no experience. Lie on your resume. You could say that you work for me and you could give yourself any title that you want. You know, like if you have a friend with a L.O., you know, and it's not that. You know, I'm a completely immoral person is that I understand that his competition is out there. They're on Indeed. You know, these companies are getting hundreds of resumes and they're they're going to just look at the one that pops out the most. You know, so just just understand these things. Don't be limited by your ethics because nobody else in this country is. And, you know, so we will be continuously behind as long as that's the case. It's like it's like that kid who parents punishes him heavily for fighting. You know, and then he gets picked on by the other kids. It's like, listen, it's not fair. 
it's not fair, but you, you're eventually going to have to fight back. You, you just are. That's the only way you're going to survive the school round. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, remember LAR, I said, you know, yeah, we're going to keep this one like an hour and a half. And I, said, uh, I always, right. say, that. <laughs> I always right. say that. And then here we are. Here we are. I got a question for you, LAR. How many babies does it take to shingle a roof? I'm not going to go down this dark humor. Depends on how thinly you slice them. Oh, that's not uh... That's that's yeah. that's happening. Use Filipino babies, black babies, but you can make a checkered pattern and stuff, and you can use the melanin on top for absorption of the radiation, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, with that, I'm gonna start giving our closing thoughts here on this. We covered a number of topics. We started out with OJ and uh, white society being shocked at the fact that the LAPD and by proxy other police departments. Were that corrupt? LER mentioned the fact that around that time of the OJ trial was same was happening the the Rampart scandal and also Rodney King. We also talked about the fact that Iran retaliated retaliated against Israel, largest missile and drone strike ever known to man. And here we are with SBF ending up with uh, talking about risk, understanding that risk is rare, risky being bold and risky and of course intelligent and having a game plan for how you're going to execute on things is a rare talent that is actually uh, valuable, needed in the world because the world is not a stagnant place. We're not just staying in straight jackets, you know, bound by the rules. Otherwise nothing ever happens. So to be on the frontiers of the rule breakers, uh, the people who find new paths and new avenues and create Ubers and whatnot, you have to skillfully, uh, they're, they're, there are many who fall off this particular path, right? So um, <laughs> that's why it's risky <laughs> by definition. But, you know, if you play your cards right, you can avoid getting into high consequence situations. And hopefully if you're in the hood, you avoid that. Or if you're lucky, you're, you're not in the hood and you're in a place where you're allowed to explore a little bit more without the cops throwing you in jail for 25 years, right? And when you find yourself in, in places such as corporations and whatnot, don't look at these rules as though, you know, they're supposed to, you know, they're written by God. Um, they're not a uh, surprise. But with that, we're going to start with Game Changer. Closing thoughts, sir. Then Mr. Yeah, Tizo and then LER. And, uh, but anyways, go ahead. I know I got here great, but um, great conversation. These are all topics that, you know, um, that topics of interest of mine. They don't necessarily hit home, but, you know, these are definitely topics of interest of mine. And I was grateful for an opportunity to give my input on these topics i always enjoy coming here oh well we're always happy to have you mr game changer uh mr kaizo uh give us your closing thoughts um and uh, how's your case going by the way you were accused by 14 year old boy in kenya i heard <laughs> right well uh it's still going on we'll see um I think when you look at this whole situation, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, O.J. Simpson, uh, Sam Bankman, as well as uh, the recent sort of, um, you know, bombardments by Iran into Israel that unfortunately failed. Sorry, I mean failed. Uh, I didn't want to. Yeah. I, I think what this kind of tells us is a couple of things. Right. First of all, they only came for Sam Bankman because he failed. If Solano prices were different, right, it 10 x at the right time, I don't think the government would have been so harsh on him because they would have been like, okay, IRS would have come in, okay, look, yeah, you know, collected whatever is due to them, right? So at the end of the time, sorry, at the end of the day, these things are very temporal and uh, spatially sort of uh, confined, meaning, you know, spirit of the times, uh, who's doing it, class, culture, and all that kind of stuff, and who are they coming for? In those situations with oj uh you know is what it is he probably did it um i know lar thinks he didn't but did he did it too you know so all these things most likely happened and black uh, men don't kill had... thank you uh, say, say that again no well, black men uh lar says black men don't kill so there you go yeah exactly right they don't black they... men don't cheat black men don't kill <laughs> black men don't steal <laughs> We'll wait until I have my say. Don't create uh, baby mamas. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> and I, I just have to reiterate that Kaizo mentioned, and this is where you came, Mr. Uh, Dr. Thunder, that the peak of life, like he said, OJ had a great life. I mean, he was able to get away with killing a white woman. I mean, isn't that? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you lived oh, to 76 man. and uh, you kill one of uh, D's over there. <laughs> oh, goodness. Some will say he was destined uh, to do that. But yeah, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I think ultimately with all these things, uh, look, be careful, right? Greed is a powerful emotion. And you need to kind of understand, is, is a greed worth it, right? The extra level of excitement or whatever it is that you're seeking, is it worth it, right? Did he got himself in crazy stuff? Now he's paying his dues. Uh, OJ got lucky. Um, Sam Bankman is very unlucky, right? Uh, but they're all playing similar games. He's not playing a different game than banks for the most part. If you really look at the math that the banks play, it's crazy. So at the end of the day, just uh, play the status quo. Um, focus on the what is legally um, allowed by you and, you know, take risks if you want here and there. But just understand that, you know, you are a pawn in a game and uh, don't be played too much. Um, and in terms of Israel as well and all that kind of stuff, I hope that things get worse just because my money's dropped a lot uh, since Kenya's economy went better. So I hope things get worse so that the dollar keeps increasing and the Kenyan shilling goes down and uh, that's the truth there you go there you go there you go yeah it's kind of interesting when you start spending those uh, other volatile currencies that are volatile relative to the dollar and whatnot and you're like crap the dollar is uh dollar's getting stronger it's messing up anyways lar what are your thoughts sir Final. Dun, dun. first and foremost with the oj thing i'm gonna say it this way i think the issue becomes when it's somebody black People view black people with Stockholm syndrome, slave eyes for white people. Because he's black, he had to do it because I believe white people. That's that to me, that's what it ends up with. Doesn't matter what actually happened, I just believe the white people. The second thing, as far as Iran and Israel, interestingly enough, this goes down that same playlist because guess who all the bad countries are? the people who don't like what the white people were doing to them. Same scenario. At some point, people, as a, as a world, what I, what I think about with BRICS and all the other things going on with global politics, the world is slowly waking up to realize that, man, because they're white, I've been overlooking a lot of shenanigans. Because you're seeing it from country to country, continent to continent. To continent. The end part, about uh, SBF and what that entails. I'm gonna say something, my apologies to you, GC, because I know what you were saying as far as um, payola being illegal. What, what we know as payola and what pay, payola actually is, there is a payola that's illegal. A record label can't pay a record station. That's illegal. But an artist paying off a DJ Th that's that's why they never f actually went any further with that because artists can pay off DJs and labels can actually pay off DJs. So that's what I was meaning about that with the wrist thing. Motown Records is the label. Yeah, but they they can't pay the records, the radio station. Okay, gotcha. See, labels used to pay the station up front. Gotcha. Okay, I, I understand uh, that. Um. The, the the thing with SBF is, it's just in a general sense. Um, I think what we are not really uh, saying enough is when you live in a country based on a scam, scams are going to come from that. Agreed. So we assume that, you know, the world is, in, our society is able to handle scams, but truth be told, um, through all of our biases, we're not necessarily able to because somewhere along the line we go to I trust him. He looks like a kind of guy that I that would that would do the right thing type of thing. So you you find people falling over and over again for the same thing. Um, that's pretty much the gist of it. No, I, I I see what you're saying. I'm saying that you know this country was founded by scammers. Granted. 
Um, and they've been scammed. The oldest scam that I heard of was the railroad scam where, you know, the government was paying by the mile of track for railroads and Union Specific just just didn't do it. They just told the government that, hey, you know, we're building this track and there was no track there and they just took the money. That's gangster. I mean, like, you know, they, they eventually got caught. That's how it's in history. But like th we've this country has been scamming since the beginning. And I'm saying, like, you know, perhaps we should be looking into the scam business. That's 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 what I'm saying. I, A little bit, you know, I, like I, I, my point is what Dr. Thunder was saying. It, it's a it, in theory and in consequences different. Because the consequences, when even when you brought up the, the thing about the, the um, resume, in theory, you're right, because everybody lies on their resume. In practice, somehow, people who aren't black all of a sudden say, mm, this is a black person, black name. Let me, let me dig into all their whole life now to make sure this is legit. Maybe. That's the, that's the complete difference. Maybe, but, you know, if you... Not if maybe. No, but LAR, if it takes them six months to figure it out and, you know, you get 200K from that job, then you just made $100,000 before they figured it out, where you could have been sitting at home broke with an honest resume. No, so, no I get it. Normally, that's somebody that, that's non-black that can do that and, and go six months. Normally, if you're black and you do that, you're not going to get hired. Thus, that whole spiel about when black oh, people no, change their names on resumes, then they get callbacks. LAR, that is that is not true. You know, when, okay. I, when I first graduated, I lied ridiculously on my resume, ridiculously. You know, so that is and and yes, I've worked. I, you know, yes, I yeah, that's not true. You got away. Congratulations. You're not the norm. The okay, exception is trying to get you to, to snitch on uh, yourself. Uh, Strap it. Oh, I mean, I don't have to lie anymore. This is way past the statute of limitations. But yes, you know, I mean, they don't want people with no experience. So listen, do what you got to do. It is, it is a cutthroat society, you know. I mean, there's all type of white people and Nigerians out there that 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 just don't have, they don't play by the same rules as other people. They, they yeah, get I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to, <laughs> I'm going to try to, I'm, I'm going to try to thread the needle on this. Um, now, of course, I'm not going to advocate for people to lie on their resume. Um, and to you know, to my to my knowledge, there is nothing and has not been anything on my CV, which is basically a super detailed resume that is not legitimate. Didn't actually happen. That being said, when you're in a scenario, a one-on-one. -on -one scenario with someone and they're asking you can you do this job for me um then you have to figure out what you need to say to get the gig and so there could be some gray area associated with that because uh you know no one is born with experience no one is born with experience so you're going to have to be able to say something that gets them to be willing to take a risk on you, you know, because there's going to be, you know, chances are there are other people that have experience that they could just call up and just give them a break. So it does create a challenge. Um, and I'm not going to tell people what to, you know, you know, specifically to lie on their resume. Uh, but you I, may need to in a one on one situation when you actually are sitting down and talking to someone, you may have to be creative in the way that you frame your skill set so that it is appealing to them. And, and that it's and that's its own skill set, um, you know, to be able to do that. You know, interviewing well uh, is not just about all the experience that you have on your resume. Interviewing well has to do with, a, it's a, there's a lot of other layers. Um, now I will say if black folks are getting invited to, to these interviews, especially in the final rounds when, when you know, these, these employment decisions are being made, if we're not present in those scenarios, we're not going to be particularly good at interviewing. And then that, 
that, of course, is going to play against us. Um, it's actually maybe the only positive. What what is it? The Rooney Rule M- might be the only positive thing about that rule in in, uh, uh, in the NFL, where at least black coaches uh, would be interviewed, so then they would get that experience. So then, in the future, they could interview better, and you know, and they've been seen by more people. So possibly that's that's better, although. They still don't, you know, in the park. Yeah, I remember. So, well, I, I tell young people this, and, and this is to all you 20-somethings listening right now. When looking for a job, look at the job description and make your resume exactly like that. Don't care what it is. Don't care what it is. If if, if, if the job description says, you know, I'll pay you $600,000, but we need somebody that lasted around with John Jones, I will put that on my resume and leave that up to them to prove it otherwise. Like that, that is on them, you know, like, you know, somebody say, you know, did you graduate at the top of your class? Yes, I was the tallest one. Don't, d- listen, I have no qualms with doing that because I know what the others are doing. I know what the competitions are doing. I know what these white boys are doing. I know. Yeah, I yeah, know but the problem that. is, yeah, but the problem is, man, I think with, with uh, overtly and openly advocating for that, I think the problem is, is that the consequences are different. There are no consequences. The consequences you are different. The job, you didn't have the job before you. Yeah, you yeah, yeah but yeah, job. but yeah, yeah, but the but the issue is, is, say if you get the job and they find out six months in that you because lied on your resume, right. they and they haul you in and they fire you. Then also, what happens is that reputation follows you. It does so then not. now you've been you've been black not. blackballed. It does, no, it does not. There is no black ball. I've been in this industry for a very long time, Dr. Thunder. There is no black ball. There is none. There is no black ball. It is illegal for a company to say that you were fired. That's illegal. So there is no black ball. They don't get yeah, yeah, but it, Okay. Okay. Let, but let's, talk, let, let's fellas, talk about this. It's called black yeah. ball. So when it comes to you, it works. I have yeah. Never- yeah. And, and here's, here's, and let me, let me say, let me say this too. You just said that it's illegal. But we're also talking about potentially taking risk with stuff that is legal and illegal on the gray on the gray area. You don't think yeah, but there's no cool. gain. There's no gain for the company. There's a lot of risk because it's a financial risk. You can't sue that company, you know. So, but there's no gain for them to tell the next company that you were fired. There's none. So yes, lie. I lied like like back in my working at Burger King days. Have you ever been late to work? That is a stupid question. Everybody has. But do you think that you you you, you think I told them that? No. And and they know I've been late to work because everybody's been late to work once. Like it's a stupid question. I lie anyway, and I recommend each and every single person to do so without hesitation. This is money we're talking about, and that's and and and, and that's I did that in the broke days. Now that we're talking about yeah, real. So- Six months of work, yeah, I'm a- of work is like you know um, half. Uh, if you're talking about like real high salaries, that's like half of a of a of a you know a midwestern house. You know, forget. Yeah, that. I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I am for people taking risks and people looking at what the laws are and figuring yeah, out how they can exploit the loopholes and figuring out how how. Certain laws, like breaking certain laws, is not is not equivalent to sinful behavior. It's, this it's not, not it's not a moral feeling. No, what I'm saying, what I'm, what I'm saying, Doctor Thunder is in LAR is that we should take intelligent cost benefit analysis when we make these decisions. You know, or or, or proper risk assessments. Listen, if you are jobless and broke. And 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 somebody um, came up to you and and or you know you've seen an opportunity for a job. You know the worst case scenario is that you lie and you don't get the job. You don't pass the placement test because you lied. You know that's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is is that you find yourself in a position where you are making a lot of money and gaining experience in doing so. That is, so like the best versus the worst case scenario. It doesn't compare. Take that risk, people. 
Okay, so let, let me let me let me change the context a bit, because um, I don't work in your industry. I can I can tell you definitively that in academia, if you're if you're lying in that way, they will do the due diligence and they'll find that out, and then they will blackball. You. Okay, so in my industry. So, Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so I'll let you know. In my industry, what you put on your resume, I, I don't know. I don't know what reg, what other people do um, as far as the interview process. Our interview process and screening process is rigorous. If you say that you know something, they will test you to see if you know that. So, if you lie, then what you have to do to follow up on that lie is study, study your A double S off. That's what you do. Yeah, and Dr. Thunder. Yes. I'll let you go back, but this this kind of uh, basically exemplifies the two contexts I was talking about, right? In Game Changer is 100% in that engineering context where it's about doing the job and it's not like you can just find anybody to do the job and they don't care about, you know, plagiarism or whatever, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Listen, I, I, I'm I'm telling people to get it. Like, I mean, it's 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 tough out there, especially if you're a young person. You know, it, it is it is tough out there to break into any industry. Most of these young people have useless degrees and they're just trying to fit in where they can with a bunch of other people that with useless degrees. So, you know, and but it seems like by you just saying that you're you're expanding this beyond just the field that you work in. Absolutely. You're expanding it to. OK, so that's that's where I'm and this is where I'm saying that's where I can't, you know, I I, I couldn't actually advise and wouldn't advise anybody to knowingly lie yeah that's because you're a teacher. i mean i may i may i may i may hold up i may advise for them to find a different way to frame their experiences so that it can it can it can look the way that who is looking at the resume the kinds of things that they want to want to see i would advise that improving improving their resume but i wouldn't advise them to 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 lie and and that's a, that's a different approach that's fine we don't have to agree on that and i think perhaps our our our, our, our lived experience is such that um in your career it, that's not that's not played against you but i've seen too too often in in uh, a lot of other careers especially when black folks are involved if there is uh Anything that seems to be even slightly, oh, I wonder if he's actually done this or not, they will actually go do their do their due diligence and discover that you lied or that you stretched or whatever it was, and then that'll be the reason that you get dismissed and then black folks. That's what I that's what there I see. No I'm, I'm telling you, Dr. Thunder, there is no black ball. You 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 work in education, and that's fine. There and they probably roll differently because it's a it's 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 is private or is public sector there is no black ball i repeat there is no black ball why do you think that these dudes are doing what they do because there's no black ball the only black ball is a criminal record that's it there's 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 no black ball they're not getting together like you know you can get fired from you know um from elon musk and then work for jeff bezos the next day if you are so qualified it, it there's no black ball trust me yeah, I, in, in like like I'm saying, and, and it's not just education and academia. There is very, there definitely is a black hole. Maybe it doesn't. You don't. Maybe it doesn't exist in your. Um, it it, it you okay. Mean. Listen, we could get canceled like anybody else. You know, that's 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 not the same thing. That's why I I'm a chess piece. We could get canceled. You know, just like anybody else, uh, you, we can get arrested for something illegal, and that stays on your record. But as far as blackballing, no, no. I've seen people who, who, uh, okay, I've seen people who, um, who quit, and they just they they did the glass door thing to the fullest. I mean, they flammed the company. They flamed the company on glass door like ridiculously so, made it almost impossible for them to recruit new people. They were hated by the employers after that, and they still found work, more lucrative work after that. You know, it, it is not a black ball like that. Yeah, maybe maybe our definition of black ball was different. But no, anyhow, that's, that's, that's fine. You, get fired, you can't work in this town again. That, black. 
They're okay, black. Yeah. We, we, we're not going. We're not. We're probably not going to come to come to an agreement. And um, I do have to get going, so I think we need to keep rapping if, if we're rapping. Okay. Yeah, it was on you, Doctor Thunder, to take us out. Anyways, I think everyone else got the close. Okay. Up. Well, you know, I, I, I yeah, I do agree. I, I do agree that um, you have to. You, you you have to figure out, you know what your what your okay. So morality, ethics, laws, you know, doing time. You know, there's a, there's a there's a sort of um, I, I suppose you could you could call this some sort of continuum. You have to figure out where you are where you at where you're at on that continuum, and what you're comfortable with. And I'm not going to tell folks to do something or not to do something per se. Um, but yes, I would argue that black folks would likely benefit more from taking more risks. But if we're going to do that, if we're going to advocate for black folks to take more risks, then we have to do something to the, uh, you know, the repercussions aspect of this. We, you, you can't be saying, okay, black folks take more risks well, yeah, but you taking more risks actually like is five times the risk that other folks take. You kind of can understand why folks don't want to take risks like that. And you can understand why, uh, you know, the black community, which is ungodly talented, ungodly talented. You know, I mean, if you just look at the amount of just raw talent in the black community, we should be filthy rich based on what it is that we're capable of doing, but we don't want to take risks. So, so we're, we're continually at the bottom. So that's a sort of like puzzle um, that I, I don't know if that's ever going to be solved. Um, as far as like, uh, uh, what, uh, this, you know, as far, as far as OJ, uh, you know, getting away with, uh, off a white woman or whatever, uh, Goodness, and and then therefore has 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 lived a good life. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'll 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 leave that there for perhaps a discussion another time. Um, but I, I don't really have anything else uh, to say other than what's what's already been said. So thanks, uh, thanks folks for coming through and checking us out, and make sure you come back next week, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for another riveting episode of Case Closed the highest level conversation on the most relevant topics in this space. Peace. Peace out. Peace. Vicinity no pretty, calamity if he hit me any moment, what a pity Tomorrow never certain, what was behind the curtain The face of evil smirking, with that shifty eyes averting It's not a steady bubble, the tide that pop or topple Many will fall and stumble, let the dozers gather rubble From LA to Colorado, Guinea to Burkina Faso Cannons could reach the towers and the troops will storm the castle He I say, run, run, come, we we get it because the peace that is bestowed upon the meek is overrated So run, run, come, make me get it Calling all your data, and your sons, we can't forget it I say, run, run, come, make me get it Because the peace that is bestowed upon the meek is overrated Lord, run, run, come, make me get it Calling all your data, and your sons, we can't forget it With the rubble steady rising, and hearts are compromising Convictions here are stifling, making evil appetizing The fists are steady forming, and Tenants is falling, defenses are withdrawing, possibilities are falling. In these circumstances, evil will make advances. Pick up your sword and lances, and be sure to take your stances. Victory is never promised. The battle is upon us. Gather the brave and honest, and the righteous in your corners.